Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse episode 296. I am Peter and joining me as always is Matt. Hey, what's up? <laughs> the voice of enthusiasm. Yeah, on this week. Small small voice, but uh, a small amount, but hooey. Yeah, but, uh, Connor is not here. Connor will be making his grand return next week, uh, should anyone be concerned. But uh <laughs> He is not here. Um, this is a DC Comics podcast. We get together, we talk about comics that we read this week. It's really quite that simple. And coming up on this week's show, we'll be talking about Detective Comics 1056, Superman Son of Kal-El, issue 9, <laughs> Trial of the Amazons, issue 13, yeah, yeah. Issue one. I'm getting distracted because Matt's dealing with dogs. Um, Batgirls issue four. Batman Urban Legends issue thirteen. Matt read some of that. Uh, we got Naomi season two issue one, and I also threw in a Patreon book because it was a Queer Weekend book, so it made sense to try and get ahead of them this month a little bit early. So I'll be talking about American Vampire issue twenty four. So that's what's coming up on today's show. So hey, love how I leave my window open. And my neighbor lets her dog out, who immediately begins to let us know she's outside. Uh, it's lovely. It's a nice, lovely day here. Thought I could open up my window. Alas. <laughs> it's still pretty cold uh, right now. It's, you know, it's still... We're, we're, we're verging on spring. Like, spring's kind of, like, creeping in and, like, knocking on the door a little bit. But we're not quite in spring territory yeah, you, yet. You, you have proper seasons there. We don't. We have we have false spring, and then return of winter, and then second false spring. I think we're in third false spring at this point. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a nice sixty degrees outside. Uh, no wind for the first time this week, so that was nice. But yeah, we're 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 almost there. It'll it'll be a hundred degrees in no time. Oh sure, yeah. Uh, it tends to be early May when suddenly it'll get very warm. Uh, that tends to be when I notice it. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, there's a little bit of news, although not comic book specific news, more DC and other media news. Mm -hmm. But it, se it seemed worth talking about a little bit, if nothing else. Uh, and of course, there's always time to start with the top 10. Uh, we're looking again at the League of Comic Geeks top 10 based on the number of pulls on their website. So, we'll get into it. Uh, I can say that DC is the top pulled book this week. Mm -hmm. um, would you care to guess which one? Oh, I, I know now. I'm onto this. Are so, you looking at it? Yeah. Uh, well, well, mainly to pull up what books we're talking yeah, okay, about. Okay, all right. So there's no point yeah, in asking yeah. you to guess. All right, all right. No. All right, so Detective Comics 1056 does take the top spot. Not really that surprising. Uh, but then we do veer over it's a Marvel heavy top five because number two is Amazing Spider Man 92, mm -hmm. number three is Thor 23, number four is Devil's Reign issue five, and number five is Venom issue six. So DC took the top spot, but the next four were all Marvel. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe that's just you know indicative of the fact that DC had less books out this week, seemingly, yeah. than, than most, but uh. Yeah, so that's the top five. And then number six is Joker issue 13. And then Superman Son of Kal El comes in at number seven. And then we have Spawn issue 327. Do you know what? I respect that that's still on its numbering. I respect yeah. that. That it's in the 300s and it's keep, it keeps going. You know, regardless of quality, regardless of how much I may or may never, never read it. Uh, I've never read a single issue of Spawn. I've read some. I've read the first like 25 issues, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my stepbrother was really into Spawn when we were growing up. Mostly the HBO show that we weren't supposed to watch, but, you know, when no one's around. Mm -hmm. um, and then the movie. I remember going and seeing that movie. That was the first time I've had a, what did I just watch? So Well, the, yeah, the movie's not exactly high art, but it yeah, means. Yeah. Uh, so. Number nine is X, Deaths of Wolverine, issue four. And number ten is X... Lives of Wolverine issue. Has there always been lives and deaths of Wolverine? Is he... I think I I think so. I feel like this is the first time they've been in the same week, so I've never noticed until now that there's two different series. I just assumed it was the same one I every had, time. I had the same reaction when I saw them right next to each other. <laughs> I was like, okay, all right. Because it's not like one's issue one, so I thought, oh, maybe it's like one ends and they're going into right. lives afterwards. No, 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 they've been running concurrently, mm -hmm. and yep. they're both in issue four at the same time. That's uh, kind of weird. 
Uh, so yeah, and then all DC stuff, like later down the list, you got Urban Legends and Batgirls, I think just sneaking into the top 20, and then from there, the other stuff is way down in the dumps, so, uh, not super surprising where things are falling necessarily, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah, uh, yeah, not, not much to add here, uh, very Marvel heavy top 10, although Spawn clearly still popular amongst a certain group of comic fans, as it's still ranking in there. Mm-hmm. I'm not quite at Saga levels, where Saga comes in and takes a top yeah, spot, but... just, uh, kicks the door in. Yeah, so... Very cool. There you go. That's top ten. Uh, so yeah, news! There's a little bit of news this week. Uh, all movie-related stuff... Well, actually, not movie and TV, I should say, but... Uh, we have, we have some release dates moving around, and mostly I just want to crack some jokes about this, but I will give you those five... There's five release date changes. Four of them are delays, mm-hmm. and one of them is, uh... Uh, uh, the opposite of a delay. It's the a reverse, yeah, a push up. A push, it's been pushed up, yes. It's been moved forward. So I'll give you the delays first. Uh, and these are in order of when they're going to release now. So, first to be released in July 29th this year, which has been pushed back a couple of months from May, is League of Super Pets, which got a, a proper trailer this week, actually, where mm-hmm. you could hear Keanu Reeves voicing Batman, and it looked amusing. That's what it was. Stupidly, stupidly excited when I realized it was Keanu Reeves. Yeah, uh, so, and then I think uh, Chris Hart, I think, is a... No, Bat Kevin Doc. Hart is Ace. Uh, the Rock is I said, Crypto. I said Chris Hart, Kevin Hart, yes, Kevin yeah. Hart's the name. Yes. Uh, so, no, I mean, this, this looks fun for what it is, but that's coming out in July, so it's not a big delay. Uh, similarly, not a huge delay still this year, but Black Adam has been pushed from July to October 21st, 2022. So, th- th- that's still coming out this year. Two things, though, have moved out of this year. Uh, the first of which, which was originally coming out on December 16th, is Aquaman 2, which is now coming out on March 17th, 2023. Mm-hmm. So that's been pushed to early spring next year. So basically a year from now you'll get Aquaman 2. And then The Flash, and this is the really funny one, because of how long it's taken to get this made and how many delays it's already had. I, I will remind you before I say this, that... Ezra Miller was announced as The Flash the day the CW TV show premiered. It was that day. That was the day they said, hey, in 2020, there's going to be a cyborg movie. Obviously, that never happened. But that was that day where they announced that slate where there was two Justice League movies and all the other things they had planned. The Flash, which was going to come out in November now, that was its current release date, has been pushed again to June 23rd, 2023. That's next summer now. Which means it'll have been eight years. No, wait, more than that. Nine years. It's been nine years nine. since Ezra Miller was announced as The Flash when that movie finally comes out. And of course, it's barely a Flash movie by all accounts from what we're yeah. seeing. But, uh, so. Rough times. Rough times. Wild stuff. Uh, uh, the only one that was the opposite, and, he, and there's, there's maybe a juicy detail to this because it's kind of swapping with Aquaman 2, is Shazam 2, which was meant to come out next June. So that's actually been pushed mm-hmm. up quite a bit. That was meant to be June uh, 2nd, 2023. Mm-hmm. It's been pushed forward to December 12th, 2022. What is notable about that date? I'll tell you what's notable. Well, not maybe about that date specifically. I haven't checked the exact date, but that's the same time that Avatar 2 is coming out. Oh, boy. And Aquaman originally was clashing with Avatar. Now, I don't know which one was on the exact day and if it's maybe a few days in advance now or whatever, but um, I think... I've seen arguments that they're essentially saying, okay, Avatar 2 is probably... I mean, it may not be as gargantuan as the first one, but it's probably going to do quite well. So the two thoughts in mind are, one is that Shazam 2 skews a bit younger than Aquaman, so maybe you're like, oh, we're going for more of the kid audience, so that can survive next to it, Maybe. Uh, the other argument is is they're expecting Shazam 2 not to do very well, so they're just sort of throwing it out to die uh, next to a bigger movie, which... I, given a choice of what I'm seeing first, it's going to be Shazam. Oh, not so, for me, not even by a long shot. Yeah, yes, I know. I, like, I, I, I'm I, a big James Cameron fan. There is no way in hell I'm not seeing Avatar 2. I think it's funny you think Avatar 2 is still coming out this year. I have always suspected it isn't. I, I know people like to joke because you know, they were delayed 100 million times over the last decade. Yeah. But last decade, yeah, it's the last been decade. in production longer than the Flash. It, no, that's true. It has been. Mm. But here's the thing, though: when James Cameron says to me, not that he said it's personally to me, but when James yeah. Cameron says to he me, called you, he called you, he called you up on the phone. <laughs> yeah. and he's like, "Listen, 
<laughs> Avatar 2. It's going to be delayed. It's going to be worth it, though. When he says to me, I've got a, a four-movie plan epic spinning out of that first Avatar movie, I'm not saying it's definitely going to be great, but it's James Cameron. I'm going to give him some some leeway here, okay? Your grandkids are going to love Avatar 4. <laughs> it's like Back to the Future. You know, maybe you're not ready for that, but your kids are going to love it. Yeah, uh, maybe. But, like, regardless of what you think of the Avatar movie and possible sequel, um, I don't think it's shocking to think that... <sighs> Warner Brothers, from a DC perspective, mm-hmm. other than Batman, which is doing very well, had a big opening weekend mm-hmm. last weekend, it's doing well, uh, it was already kind of set in stone, really, but obviously they're going to announce the sequel sooner than later, I imagine. I'm sure there's a dump truck of money arriving on Matt Reeves' house as we speak. Yep. But, uh, clearly I think they, 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 they know that whatever comes out next to that is probably going to get overpowered, and... Honestly, like this is the sad thing about this list is that this list just makes me realize how little I give a shit about most of these movies. Um, I I really excited. care about Black Adam, but I, I'm a huge rock guy. I mean, well, we went thing. over this last time. In so. theory, I I care about all of these properties. I like all of these things mm-hmm. from the comics. I like the idea of a good movie of all of these things, but mm-hmm. um. Black Adam is just kind of a weird thing to me right now. I don't really know what to expect from it. Aquaman 1, I thought, was really mediocre to, to bad, so I'm yeah. just not excited for the second one. The yeah. Flash looks like a mess that's trying to be everything but a Flash movie. And Shazam 1 I did like, but it it wasn't like a like an earth-shattering, this is the, this is changing no. how I think about comic book movies, so now I have to yeah. see the second one as soon as. I think it'll be fun, but I'm not expecting it to be like something I need to see right away. Yeah, uh, in terms of getting a sequel... That one I was like, I wasn't counting on. So the fact that it's coming out this year is it's pretty cool. But yeah, no, just Black Adam, just because I enjoy The Flash, or The Flash, I enjoy Dwayne, The Rock Johnson. Um, and the, you know, you have the whole Justice Society making an appearance, well, certain members of the Justice Society, anyways. So um, that's right up my alley. Uh, I'm just not I'm excited for that one. But the rest of them, you're right. I'm not. I don't believe the Flash movie's ever coming out. I I will be, you know, and then on top of it, it feels just like a a mess of ideas, given everything we've heard. And so, yeah, I just I don't know. Yeah, I I just I'm not convinced it's going to be good. I have no reason. It's, it, right now, it's just a name. There's barely a trailer. Like I'm not. Con- mm-hmm. There's nothing about it that makes me think this is going to be good. This Black Adam movie. Yeah. So I'm not excited. And. If if not if I've ever learned nothing or if I've learned anything from recent movies to me is that movies are a lot like comics. It's really more about the creators than it is about the properties. And yeah. Batman's really good because it's Matt Reeves directed a good movie. That that's that's why it's good. It's not yeah. because it's called Batman. So no. my attitude with with cause, cause I think comic book movies right now feel really tired to me. Like I'm not excited about most of these DC movies. I'm not excited about just about anything that Marvel's doing right now. I'm just I'm sick of it. And that's not to say that I'm sick of superheroes. I still love comic books. I'm reading comic books every week. Yeah. I'm having a blast reading some well, of these comic books. That's that's how I was with the with the TV stuff. With like the you know, I love Superman. I just can't get into Superman and Lois. Like, I'm sure it, like it's there's nothing wrong with it. I just don't have that drive to to watch it. Um, and and most most stuff. I mean, I'll show up and watch the the Disney Plus things because those feel more like an event. People are talking about them, and my friends are watching them. You know, you and Connor are really the only people I know that are watching that we're watching Superman and Lois. Yeah, well, him for um, somewhere because I. Yeah. You know, I and, season two was showing yeah. some really bad warning signs, and I, I, you know, I've I've heard mixed things about it since I stopped watching, but I did see people on Twitter complain about how much screen time Lana and Lana, Kayla were getting. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh dear. And that's easily the part so far of season one. I just don't care. It's oh yeah, he's the worst part of season one. For I, sure. I don't like him. He's a caricature. It wasn't even like on Supergirl when they brought in um oh, what's his name? Sam Witwer as that character to where you could tell they were doing something interesting mm. with, with that. This is just not there. He's he's super bland. So that said, I'm excited to watch Star Girl and I'm I'm gonna start watching season two of that soon. Um yeah. yeah, and that that's my wheelhouse of stuff. So like you said, it's more about the not not even just the the creative team, the characters there, you know, that 
I like Courtney as a character across. No, I said opposite. I'm not, you're, no, I'm saying the opposite. It's not about the characters. The characters, because the characters have no indication of how they're going to be treated, what the rating quality is going to be like. Like the characters are almost the least important thing at this point. <laughs> like I, I have learned my lesson. I am not getting excited for anything because X character is going to be in it, or because they're claiming it's this character's show or movie. There's, there's, there's no point in that anymore. Yeah. Well, that ship has I'm, sailed. I am still a sucker for that. I mean. I'll, I'll still go. Like again, not rushing out to see Flash or even Aquaman. Um, oh, I'm not seeing right? them in theaters. Like I, I, yeah. I will be shocked if I see those in theaters. Um, every time I ask my wife if she wants to watch Aquaman, she's like, "No, that's okay." Um, and and she's usually, I mean, she's just rewatching. She started a couple weeks ago going back through the Infinity Saga while she's been working from home, and just having them on while she works. So she likes this stuff. She's just not motivated for DC. She has a DC guy that kind of hurts, but I don't blame her either. It's weird. Like, it just, it stinks. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, even most of that, I don't want to rewatch, to be honest. There's only a few key. Oh, no. I, I, that... I told her to wait on certain ones that, you know, that I like to watch. Um, but yeah, just go through them. They're fine. You know? Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, after a while, the fast food quality of a lot of superhero blockbuster stuff, like, it starts to, like, I think you start to notice it more and more. And obviously, mm -hmm. that threshold is different for different people, and some people will never feel it. Some people will just yeah. be happily and satisfied till the end of time if they keep pumping these things out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I have reached a, a point <laughs> that I am... And that's, and that's fair, too. Like, again, yeah. everyone has their own different tastes on stuff, and... You know, I'll still go see them in, in the theater because uh, I, I do like the event quality of them. Uh, that that said, like the the I love Oscar Isaac, right? Mm -hmm. The amount of people that are stupidly excited for Moon Knight, I don't get based off of the two trailers I've seen. I, I feel like they're just excited to have the new, you know, whatever the Marvel thing is that they can like. It's the, it's the hype and cycle. It's, 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 yeah. it's become this thing to be hyped for these things and yeah. say everything looks amazing. And I'm like, yeah. even off a trailer, if it looks good, like it's as much as I, I, I have been very positive about Batman and don't worry, there is a review of the Batman coming on uh, David's guesting on one. We're recording that on Ooh. Monday, so people can look forward to an actual conversation. Fun. I thought it was worth waiting so I could talk to someone rather than just nice. sit and blabber myself. But anyway, so as positive as I have been about that movie and will be when I actually do the mm -hmm. review, I wasn't like super hype before. I mean, I, I expected good things because it was Matt mm -hmm. Reeves, but if you go back and listen to me, at no point did I say things like, oh, I can't wait for this new movie, or, I'm, yeah. you know, like, I'm counting down the days, or, I'm like, and... Dude, Batman snuck up on me. Before I knew it, I was like, oh, I gotta get tickets. Like, you know, um, so, yeah, I, I fully feel that one. I, um, and all, I think, you know, and this all makes it like a bit of a dirt conversation, but all I'm really yeah. trying to say is, you know, it doesn't feel special anymore. Like the, the 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 gimmick of all of this existing has worn off, and that's okay mm -hmm. because it means we can focus on what actually matters. We can focus on rating quality. We can focus on mm -hmm. when they're actually saying something with the characters, or when they're they're, they're actually accomplishing something. Right. Yeah. And that's all I, I want from cinema. That's all I yeah, want. Yeah, no, I I listened to one of my favorite film podcasts. We we're talking about Batman. It kind of upset me just as a comic book guy that they were kind of trashing comic books, and it's kind of that stupid old. Uh, try like worn out argument like oh this is kid stuff and it was like guys no like what you're talking about there are comic books that that get the vibe of the batman right like even oh, yeah. with Foster I mean... from earlier this year you wouldn't describe that as quote kid stuff like sure certain kids could read that but it's not aims where like kids so, like to yeah, talk that, down to comic book movies. I think that's just like, ignorance as to what... Because yeah. comic book, just like movies and TV, can, can be as kiddy or as mature as mm -hmm. as the creators right. make it. And I, honestly, with, with the Batman, like, it's probably the most comic book movie I've ever watched in mm -hmm. some ways. It felt like a comic book to me. And that's what they were... They didn't like. And I was like, well... Wait. So that's like saying you didn't like a Western because it was too much of a Western. Or you don't like a spy movie because it's too much of a spy movie. It's like, well, isn't that what Matt Reeves is going for? Right? He wanted to make a, a Batman comic book. Like, it's just a misunderstanding of comic books, and it drives me nuts. And for them to... They kept comparing it to Seven, which I get. Like, there are some very Finchery moments in yeah, the Batman. There's, there's some, uh, you know... 
not even ideas, but there's there's just some there's some vibes and feels and sort of it mm. wants to evoke certain things that Seven kind of made famous. Right. There's definitely and some he's of like, that well, in there. You know, just the fact that this is trying to be Seven is like just be your own thing. And I was like, uh, okay. Uh, didn't this guy also brought up how the writer of Seven was also a little bit inspired by early Batman comics? So it's just like this is art, right? Art supposed to inform other art like i was just it's just these things where i feel like if the batman wasn't a comic book movie certain people would look at it differently and that's what's starting to drive me nuts it's just like just if you don't like it, you didn't like it that's cool you don't have to be like i didn't like it because it was a comic book movie you know um so it's just it, it's starting to feel the the boomerang effect right where people are just tired of them because there's so many of them right now and i understand that but at the same time you can't cross them all off just because you know they still went and saw batman you know um you no know, i'm tired of them all because most of them are really in the same range of they're okay they're mm-hmm. just fine they're right but at least with you pete i can say that you like like shang chi we disagree about shang chi but you have very uh, like your observations of shang chi are just beyond uh it's a comic book movie you know it's like, well, no, this didn't work, and that didn't work, and this didn't work. And so, yeah. that's it. It's, and it wasn't the Jackie just... Chan movie that people promised me it would be. Right. There's, like, one right. scene that's vaguely Jackie Chan-like, mm-hmm. and it robs it of its Jackie Chan style of martial arts and comedy because right. there's far too many cuts. The reason why the Jackie Chan movies where he's doing all these stuff, mm-hmm. like, because there's literally a scene in Police Story where he's on a bus, right. and he's, like, diving and ducking and going around the, the poles and going out mm-hmm. the window and stuff. The reason why that stuff is so much fun is because it's all stunt work and it's captured right. in a couple of shots. Uh, Shang-Chi, there's tons of CG around. There's like right. you know, lots of camera cuts. There's slow right, motion. I, I, I didn't mean to go off on shot. I, I just, I, I, like, yeah. it just it frustrates me. That was the thing that frustrates me so much about that movie. It's like, oh, it's like, a, it's, it's like Marvel did a Jackie Chan movie. No, 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 no. There's like one scene that kind of tries to be and misses the point entirely. Okay. Anyway, anyway. Okay, yeah. I should have said Eternals, but we were both on the same side of Eternals. <laughs> you know? Um, and so... You know, and those are just the two off the top of my head because, you know, Batman, we both took warmingly to, you know, so I, I can't. And most people are. This podcast I listened to were the first ones that I've really heard. And again, they weren't negative. They kept saying it was fine, but a lot of it was because of a comic movie. Um, that was their main slight and that it felt like a comic book and that, you know, weirdly wanted to see certain things that we're all tired of seeing. Batman, honestly the, the problem with the the dc movies right now is the same thing as the problem with the marvel movies which is the same thing as the problem by and large with star wars is that it's all just these big factory like we need to have more franchise things coming out and uh, you know, at a point they're, they're very fan servicey they're just trying to please people and it feels kind of hollow because it's kind of like star wars especially has this weird thing where like one thing tried to be different and unique and mm-hmm. a lot of the fan base rejected it so then they tried to course correct immediately and it just felt like they were pandering to, to people who complained. And, it, and then they uncourse corrected with some of the Mandalorian stuff and over there that they're going back into the more... I mean, I don't know what's going on in the shows, yeah. but everything they've made since then has felt like fan service to me. This Obi-Wan show yeah. coming up, uh, a so Boba good. Fett show, like all these things, they're no, all just the, fan service. The Boba show is a, one of these things that just, it's a weird thing and that they maybe shouldn't call the book of Boba Fett should have maybe called it the book of Tatooine and I it would have been okay but it's just it's very much if you were enjoying the Dave Filoni stuff from TV the Clone Wars Rebels all of that stuff that is telling the larger Star Wars story it's fine it's the people that only know Star Wars from movies and don't want to put the time in that just are like okay and the Mandalorian at first was very okay with all of that because it was very standalone. Um, but no, it, it feels very much like it's just these bigger narratives. And I wouldn't say factory as far as that. Maybe the movies. Yeah, because Rise of Skywalker, man, I still can't get over. Again, I'm not really talking about the content in the shows themselves. I'm talking about it's like a child who isn't smart enough to see that they're just being gluttonous and just wanting the thing they mm-hmm. want and disney as a whole are just like okay they've been wanting an obi-wan show they've been wanting a boba fett show mm-hmm. just give them what they want to shut them up and make them happy so right, they can make but, money and, and that's why i would disagree because the content in those shows isn't just that Girl, i can't talk to obi-wan i'm looking at the obi-wan show and it's it looks not like that 
to me at all. It looks like they're telling a story of Obi-Wan in hiding or whatever it's going to be. With Boba Fett, that's where you, you talk about a gluttonous child. That show feels like what you're talking about, but for a different reason. It just feels like somebody playing with their Star Wars toys and you're just along for the ride and you're like, oh, what the hell's going on? Like the, the show moves too fast and too slow. Um, but, you know, when I look at the movies more, I keep seeing stuff about Rogue One, right? And I know you famously do not like Rogue One. Um, and I look at that and some people say that they like it because it doesn't do the fan servicey things. But then I hear people that do like it. But it is full of fan servicey things. Right. And so you, <laughs> It can't be both, guys. Which I, I just don't know. So that's why I don't wade into this too much. I will with you. Because we've been doing this long enough now. I we're like, I, coming up on 10 years of me sitting in front of my computer talking to you about nerd stuff. So this is a comfortable place for me to do it. <laughs> but normally I don't because half the people say there's too much fan service. Other people say that it's not fan service at all. I don't know what to believe anymore. I just want to watch a movie. And like Solo was my favorite Star Wars movie. Maybe because it was a little too fan servicey. Maybe because it felt the most like Star Wars that when I was a kid, I just shut off my brain and watch something. Um, and that's fine, too. I just, you know, it's the fandom arguments are starting to get to the point where it's ruining stuff that I like. And I know that's all in my power, but I'm just like going to start shutting stuff off and be like, look, I'm going to sit down and watch. And that's it. Like, I don't care about the arguments. You guys are all just wearing yourself out for no reason. And it's like you're talking about the hype cycle. And all of this. And part of it is I kind of like that Warner Brothers in DC doesn't really have a hype cycle because everything is kind of sucked. Up the Batman. <laughs> oh, yes. uh, not Suicide Squad because we enjoyed Suicide Squad, right? Yeah, um, but no, it wasn't like, I mean, I, but, I enjoyed that movie, but it, 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 was, it didn't get... wasn't even the most exciting thing I did that day, right? Like, I oh, sure. Wasn't, yeah. I got our tickets as we got to the theater. It wasn't like this, get your tickets beforehand like we did with Batman. Um, but yeah, there's no hype cycle, which makes it, I think, me a little bit to, to bring this back around to the movies. I can be a little bit more excited for Black Adam just because I seem like the only person in that hype cycle. And and that's okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that pivoted off into a conversation mm-hmm. about uh, these big franchises and, yeah. you know, the, the mega corp Every, companies pumping them everybody, out. But... Everybody calm down. These are multi-billion dollar mm-hmm. companies that don't care about you as a person. It's fine. Like, stop. You're not going to war for <laughs> Warner Brothers you know, against Marvel and, and Disney. All right. Like we can just, man, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I've just, uh, I'm just, I'm burned out on the mainstream stuff. And cause more and more, it does feel like it is just part of a factory that's pumping out shit for the most part. There's exceptions. Of course, there's always going to mm-hmm. be some exceptions here or there. Uh, but the more interesting films tend to come from elsewhere. Uh, but obviously that's not necessarily relevant to superhero shenanigans. But uh, yeah. So. <laughs> real quick, I just checked Twitter just real, real quick. And mm-hmm. the, the director of uh, Shazam, David Sandberg, just said, I'm going to address that the reason that the suits are different in this movie are not because Barry Allen messed with the timeline. It, it's because uh, of magic. Uh, just getting it out there. When you have magic in your movie, it's responsible for everything. And I thought, that's the kind of light tone I've been missing from these discussions. You know? Everyone takes everything too seriously. (laughs) Magic. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Look, I'm looking forward to Prey. I've got a Predator movie set in the Great Plains. Uh I'm the director of 10 Cloverfield Lane. That is far more exciting to me than any superhero movie coming out this year. Hey, I'm with you on that. I am with you on that. I was trying to look at stuff that's coming out this year, and there's not really anything... You know, like, I was stupidly excited for Godzilla vs. Kong last year. Um, so far, there's nothing like that right now that I can look forward to that I'm I'm that amped for. And that's kind of sad, because I do like being excited for things. I know I just complained about that, but for my own personal stuff, or even that, that Power Rangers movie that came out years ago, I was stupidly excited for that. Um, and I just feel like there's nothing this year that's really getting me and that might just be an echo from the pandemic right like it might be last couple of years have definitely been a little on the rough mm-hmm. side as far as that kind of thing goes yeah um but yeah i mean honestly like the batman i'm probably going to see it a second time before i review it on monday and that is the first mm-hmm. time i'll have seen a, a movie a second time in the theater in at least five years yeah 
I've just not had the desire to see anything a second time yeah. in a long time. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the last thing I can remember seeing two times. It's been a while too. So. Yeah, because I used to. Do, I mean, I mentally had an unlimited card because I went to a different theater and it was easier to do. Mm-hmm. But like, even if I could do it for free, I don't know if there's many things in the last five years that I would have went to see again. Because the movies that I did love weren't the type of movies you go and see multiple times. Like. You know, my favorite movie of 2019 was 1917, but it's not the sort of movie you go and watch five times. No, I, I feel like some of these too, like you want that big. Like I don't want to watch 1917 on my on my home. As as good as my TV and stuff is, you want that immersiveness, you know. But that's also you're putting in the time. Uh, same with Avatar. Like I like to beat up on Avatar all the time. I haven't seen it a second time because the only time I saw it was in IMAX, right back when it came out, and I kind of feel like that's the way you need to see it. Um, but uh, in in theaters are kind of a a pain to deal with right now. At least here, I don't know over where you are. Um, but yeah, man, some people have forgotten how to be in movie theaters. Uh, person on their phone during Batman, bright all the way up. Like it just it annoys me. Mhm, mhm. Uh, so that was actually all a bit of news to <laughs> to get. <laughs> Uh, which is TV related, it's related to Batman. Uh, so there were two spin offs announced for Batman a long time ago. Uh, one was a Penguin prequel series, which is officially going ahead, and the other was a GCPD show, which has actually effectively been scrapped and replaced with another idea. They, they kind of. Matt Reeves is still involved, but they're doing something different. They're doing an Arkham series uh, set, I think, after the movie, which mm-hmm. is. So, uh, so there's not like a lot of official details on this yet, you know. But this is kind of like, yeah, we're scrapping the cop thing. We're doing an Arkham series instead. Um, it is slightly more interesting in that, I mean, not necessarily good examples, but they've tried the, the Gotham PD thing before. Uh, so this potentially could be something a bit more fresh if they if they're doing something fun with it. Uh, and if they actually, you know, then I think Reeves did use the word horror, you know, the horror. Yeah. Arkham's like a haunted house. I'm like, okay, okay, you're speaking yeah. some things I like. I mean, it's still going to have Jeffrey Wright as Gordon, right? Uh, I think they confirmed that. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm so, like, you could still, I mean, all the different kinds of takes on Arkham, you can always put the cops dealing with Arkham things, and it still can be a cop thing, but if he wants to edge it away from, like, more procedural, which I kind of felt like it was going to be, right? Yeah. Um, to something more horror-tinged, I think that's cool. I don't know if they've actually officially said that Wright's still going to be in it, but he was confirmed for the previous version of the mm-hmm. show. Um, and it does kind of sound like it's the project itself has morphed. Now, whether or not that keeps him around, I mean, I don't really know. But Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, I was talking about movies that uh, I'm, I would be excited for. I just remembered that a new Jurassic World's coming out. The thanks, thanks, Pandemic, for ruining my brain. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm... I'm mildly yeah, curious you on that it. you just you just said it yeah like i'm looking at the ones that are coming out this year and i was like oh yeah that's that is coming out oh man I mean, also so- halloween ends pete yes yeah, so i know halloween ends is coming out <sighs> hopefully hopefully it'll die tonight um yeah jurassic, jurassic park's a weird one because you know i i had fun with the past two i kind of liked how schlocky this the last one got mm-hmm. but not in a way where i'm super excited and like people on twitter are freaking out because the original cast are and i'm like like how many franchises have done this now where they bring yeah. back the cast members in the original movie that, stop it stop said, reacting to this you know that's a, that image as a, as a huge jurassic world or jurassic park fan seeing you know dr Sat- sattler grant and malcolm together on the screen it's pretty cool. That doesn't justify the entire movie, but just as an image, it it did hit me. As, I will. Oh, it's cool. I will say if 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 they have Goldblum say any of his lines from the original film, I'm going to be annoyed. What about stuff from Lost World? Can can he do the ooh and ah? That's how it always starts. Uh, I don't want any direct quote because. That's the thing. I cringed hard seeing Spider Man No Way Home. There's a there's a moment yeah. where William Defoe says, "I'm something of a scientist myself," and I cringed. <laughs> it was so forced, and like, oh, this has become a meme now. We have to put this in, that, and it just it felt so tacky. That got clapped in my theater. Your theater was full of idiots. Yeah, oh, a hundred percent. Did you not miss the part where he talked about the guy with the, or the lady with the light with her cell phone during Batman? 
Uh, yes, full of idiots. So I like I don't want him to. <sighs> like I'm not saying there's not a way where he could say life finds a way and it would work in context. As long as he just says that on its own, like he understands that everyone else is like knows what he's saying. Right. But see yeah, if he Mike actually bu- if he builds up to it, or if he, uh, I don't know, like sort of reiterates the whole thing, or like I'm going to be annoyed. I'm going to be annoyed mm-hmm. at the fan service shit. So they better not do it. You, you know what I would love is just in the, in the in, in honor of Hammond, that that you know with all the craziness of how Fallen Kingdom went. Now there's dinosaurs out in the world with humans. Malcolm goes. You know what though? John did take care of the condors. Because, you know, famously, Hammond says, if I was doing this with condors, you wouldn't have an issue. You know, just the fact we see like a, a shot of a condor soaring and Malcolm goes, oh, he actually he actually followed through. That's nice. As the world's falling down around him. Um, yeah. I don't know who else would get a kick out of it besides me, but I know I would. I just want some fun schlock. I'm not expecting anything great. You, you do prefer Jurassic uh, Park 3 more than anybody I know. Um, you ride hard. It's simple. One. It's just a schlocky B movie, and it doesn't. Oh, dude, I, I, I love all Jurassic movies, so uh, you don't have to defend it to me. I'm just saying, no one rides harder for Jurassic Park three out of people I know than Pete. Um, and that's endearing. I mean, that's a bit strange. I just, it's just, it doesn't. It knows what it is. It doesn't try to be anything it isn't. And just Joe Johnson. Yeah, probably his best movie. Hmm? However, the Rocketeer, Pete. I mean, I don't, I don't remember it, to be honest, but... Okay. <laughs> I don't suspect I'm going to love it as much as you do mm. if I ever do get around to watching it again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, okay. Well, there you go. Mm-hmm. That's uh, mostly off-topic news section. <laughs> but I'm very opinionated about uh, movies, and comic book movies are such a big part of the dilution and cheap pops of that's the problem to, to use a wrestling term cinema mainstream cinema is nothing but a lot of cheap pops and no no way that that's mm-hmm. the best way to describe it actually nothing but cheap pops yeah i'm not going to disagree yeah no but sometimes the cheap pops work i mean they wrestling comes to my town and they say las vegas i i yell so i'm just part of the problem too you know yes yes you're a cheap popper i i, I am uh, all right. There you go. Um. Also, Revolution was very good last weekend. Just I'm, 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 I'm spinning off into a wrestling talk. No, I'm just good that dog collar match. I'm just saying it. It was Everything very good. I wanted, Pete, did you watch Rampage yet? Real quick. Not Rampage. No, I don't watch Rampage. Okay. Yet. Just say there's there's a promo by uh by the House of Black that seems to be maybe hinting at Punk about releasing the poison that's been held within. Mm. And yeah. if this leads to full on. A whole punk, I'm gonna lose it. Um, all I will say that's relevant to what happened this week is that I don't give a shit about the Hardys, and I never really have. So, uh, I could not care less. You don't care that that Jeff stopped to dance while his brother was getting. That out? was so stupid. He's running out to make a save because his brother's getting beat up, and he stops to dance on the ramp to his music. Actually, that is the most Jeff Hardy thing he could do, though, right? Like, maybe he's just oddly character. What would, what would have entertained me is if Sting just slapped him in the face the second he saw him for that match in TNA where he was, yeah, like, just couldn't walk. He comes to make this was... save and Sting stops him and they start <laughs> fighting. That would have been fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. All right, all right. You want some comic book talk? We're going to do some comic book talk. And yeah, the timestamps do exist for a reason, everyone. Yes, they do. <laughs> if you want to skip the nonsense part. Uh, so, Detective Comics 1056. Mariko Tamaki writing with Amanke Nahulpin on the art. This is, what, part 10 of uh, the tower? Yeah, because there's two left. So, yeah. That's it. Uh, yeah, the math checks out. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I concur. Um, it really feels like everything's uh everything's falling apart, doesn't it? It feels like Huntress is actually kind of running around like John McLean a little bit in this issue, mm-hmm. trying to find the others. Steph's doing what she's doing. Nightwing's at the mercy of Scarecrow, who ultimately tries to you know throw him out the window, uh, which leads to our big our big ending, our big mm-hmm. saving saving the day moment. So, yeah, uh, how did you feel about this one? 
So uh, I'm starting to feel like the first half, this is like, we talk about sometimes how they don't know how to end stories. You know, we get to the third act and stuff kind of. I'm starting to feel that with this, and this could still pull it out. You know, we still have two issues left. Just the sudden appearance of Scarecrow still doesn't sit with me. Um, and now it's a Scarecrow villain story. Um, and I know that we had to do that with with Dr. Ware taking a swan dive to the pavement and with uh, with um, Psycho Pirate, you know, losing control. But I just feel, almost feel like having Scarecrow there is a bit redundant when you have all of these other, you know, Tamaki created villains that we've dealt with the whole time. Yeah, you know? I'm still not sure sure how you feel about Scarecrow and the story either. I'm I'm kind of just waiting to see what they do in the last two issues to see if it kind of justifies his presence. Uh, typically, everything with the bad characters themselves, I'm really enjoying though. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Huntress fighting Mister Freeze and then having like her because there's that moment where she she holds the freeze gun like, yep. and she's looking out the window and it, it does feel like John McClane looking down at the yeah. police at the bottom of Nakatomi. It has that vibe to it. Mm-hmm. And I kind of really dig that. Yeah, it, it has really good moments. It's just kind of like it feels like I don't want to say filler because it's not like we knew for this is going to be a twelve issue story, but I I just you know some of it like Scarecrow just showing up moves a little bit too fast, you know. Not that I needed it to stop and take a break and explain Scarecrow, but like kind of why is he back in his gear again? You know, after Fear State, like. Uh, is, you know, I just, I just don't know. Yeah, we deal with uh, some other things in the issue, though. Harley does reveal to be really Harley. Um, That's the other thing that bothers me. Why? There's... <sighs> just... There's, there was kind of no reason. Just like, okay, well, she's undercover, but she's pretending to be Harley. Like, it's just a little bit overly convoluted. Um, especially if they put Huntress in there. So is she running her own thing is this is this harley doing her own thing she, she seems to be working with with babs you know so like it just it felt i almost would have preferred it to be someone that thinks they're harley uh rather than harley i just i, I don't have any negative feelings on it because it, it was clearly implied like they, they built this up this is not a surprise that it's really harley this was just a confirmation like they hinted at yeah. it in the last few issues no i know i just i admit it's just a story point i don't like it's just it's a overly just there um but it's neither here i mean nor when they there. introduced the idea i like the idea so i, I feel no mm-hmm. differently now that they've actually revealed it um yeah. you, you have huntress running around almost getting stabbed again uh getting really upset about it uh harley's running by in the background as huntress is fighting this 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 bad guy and she's running into the comms room basically to shut down all the the towers defenses so that the other bat family mm-hmm. members can get in so you have Cass and and Batwoman outside, uh, waiting to come in. Tim comes in as well. Uh, so, a lot of action stuff sort of ver- converging towards the end of the issue. But no one is where Nightwing is. No one's up where Scarecrow is about to push Nightwing out a window. Scarecrow is on the phone to the mayor. And there's, like, nothing they can do. They're all trying to get to Nightwing to save him. Nightwing gets thrown out the window. Batwoman swoops in uh, with the grapple. It does grab Nightwing by the rope that's got him sort mm-hmm. of tied up but then the rope snaps nightwing falls but the big ending is that the the bat wing is coming in you see it in the background then the, the mm-hmm. big full page is batman uh jumping out to grab him uh so batman's just arrived back in the city in time yeah. to, to save nightwing uh the actual cliffhanger though is that the the bookend of this story is a uh, psycho pirate talking to nakano's wife and her kind of like just having like this, this really weird like, honest conversation with them about how she's always been scared and she's always looked for danger mm-hmm. and fear and psycho pirates explaining that he was the one making everyone feel better the mask like helps him ample the tower was even designed to sort of like have yeah. his power travel through the building uh, in an easier way but anna Volshin shows up at the end and does a gunshot with blam and that's a cliff fire so who is she shot i mean right. with delette Tamaki kill off Psycho Pirate? I don't know. If they have no plans for him for a while, maybe they would. Well, it made it seem, he also said in the last issue, or maybe it was this issue, they kind of run together at this point, because I mm. read these so early in the week, um, that dealing with this is more preferable than what he was dealing with. So I'm wondering if this is him getting away from the darkness, because mm. he was pretty instrumental in that uh, Infinite Frontier stuff um, before popping back up here. So maybe 
maybe this is the way of him clearing, uh, you know, them clearing the DC board, if you will. Yeah, so it could, so she could have shot Psycho Pirate, she could have shot Nakano's wife, which would be a dark turn for Nakano's character at this point, if that's it, the case. I mean, it could be someone shooting an avulsion. That's, yeah, too. that's the third option, yeah, is if someone's yeah. like shot her from behind. Not a bad mm-hmm. character, obviously, because they no. don't do that, but, uh, well, maybe Jason. <laughs> maybe Jason showed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even he's not doing that right now, but... Uh, he would uh, throw his crowbar first. Yes. Uh, but yeah, it could be another uh, inmate or something shooting her from behind. That's, that's possible. Because uh, it's yep. just the word blam with the blood spatter. But it, in, it yeah. implies, of course, that someone has been hit. It also it also implies throughout this issue that, that Nakano's wife has some deep, deep... I would say deeper-seated issues than just her fear. So I'm wondering if there is a violent past somewhere in sure. there. Yeah. Not saying that it's her, but this is something that might awaken that. Um, But she, she seems... Cause up to this point, we've kind of just seen her as this kind of shell, um, and her being there, kind of wanting help for certain things. And I don't know, maybe this, you know, her presence of, of being a psycho pirate unlocked something that she thought she had locked away. Mm. And it's also possible, of course, that the gunshot's not a kill shot. Like it may just like right. we, we could start the next issue and psycho pirate's been shot in the shoulder. Like it, it, you know, it's, it's possible. <laughs> Shot in the knee. And he's just like, just throw me out of my misery. Oh, shot in the knee. That's perfect. That means you'll be hobbling like a pirate. Uh huh. There you go. He's you actually a pirate now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, the, the, episode, uh, the episode, the issue does start with uh, a flashback to uh, Nakano's wife basically doing an interview with Deb Donovan and mm-hmm. getting a headache and like sort of speaking nonsense. And Deb kind of leaves and like calls her editor or whoever and says, No, I told you this was a bad idea. The woman's a mess. Leave her alone. Leave the poor woman alone. And I think that was a really neat trick into sort of making a symp- I mean, not that she's been unsympathetic before, but this no. was just like, we're going to start this issue with making her sympathize with her. Right. And making her feel like she... Because we've seen, like, Nakano be with her and her be kind of, like, shut off and, like, sad and mm-hmm. all that. But I, I, I felt like this issue did a good job of bookending with, okay, here's another... Like, here's an outside perspective of a character that we've gotten to know saying... No, like, I'm a reporter who hunts down the story, I could be seen as ruthless, and I'm saying, no, leave her alone, just give her well, peace. And we've seen how much of a badass that Donovan is, right? Yeah. And the fact that she's, like, here, like, she's taking a stand, uh, almost as if to protect her, because that's what she needs. It's, yeah, it's, it's more, because obviously I'm not saying you shouldn't have Nakano caring about his wife, but, like, no. this is more effective than that, because Nakano caring about his wife, it feels like, oh, she's a love interest who could be fridged for his, well, just, for his you know, yeah. for, for his benefit. It's a typical character dynamic where you have someone who cares about someone else, mm-hmm. so that there's, there's, there's leverage over them when shit goes down, that kind of thing. Right. By having Deb say something like this, it's it's like corroboration that makes us go, oh no, we should sympathize for her in some way because mm-hmm. she is going through a lot, and it, you know, so and maybe they'll do something interesting with her by the end of the story. Yeah, I definitely feel like she's coming out of that shell, whether for good or for bad, and you know, because that also she's hung up on all the stuff that Nakano has been through since he's been mayor, and it's almost as if that's kind of driving her more towards, you know, whatever her issues are. So, um, but you know, it's the this is what I'm talking about where like there's parts of this that I really, really enjoy. And then there's other parts that it's just, it's, it's like a roller coaster. It's very up and down, um, but it's still worth the ride. I yeah. Guess. I'm enjoying it more than you are. Cause I mean, I, I agree. Scarecrow's inclusions feels a little bit random right now and I don't really feel like I need it, but everything else I'm enjoying kind of the, the thrill ride that it is and everything it's sort of building to. Uh, yeah. I do like how, how Tamaki is moving the pieces ever, ever so slightly with it, each issue. Cause now you have like the party crashers who, are all in Joker makeup, right? It seems like they're just mercenaries. That whoever has the most money, that's who they ally with. And so now they're allied with Scarecrow. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a really dark... Because when Harley jumps in to save Meridian, mm-hmm. it's um, like they're, they're about to rape her. Like that's yeah. that's clearly the implication of the scene mm-hmm. is that they're going to... As they quote unquote have some fun before they mm-hmm. take her to Scarecrow. And then yep. Harley comes in and saves the day with her big hammer as she does. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so how, how Tamaki's moving all these pieces and... Uh, it's very commendable like there's very much a plan uh and i i still love the you know how oracle is you know she's quarterbacking this from the beginning and then when batman shows up and she's like ah and there's all the expletives you know 
Like, yeah, no, I, they... Joe, I love about that is that you, you have Dick fall into his death. He's the one in peril, mm-hmm. and you have Batwoman. Like, everyone's trying to get to him. Batwoman gets the mm-hmm. closest and almost saves him, but then it's then the rope snaps anyway. Yeah. The fact that we were cutting to panels of Babs reacting and saying, oh, God, yeah. and being scared, it makes sense because she's the one who cares most about Dick because they have a personal relationship. Right. So it's actually kind of this relief she feels when Batman mm-hmm. grabs Dick and the Batwing at the end. Um, yeah. Her, her saying effing hell and relief was actually quite yeah. funny. And it was like yeah. a relief for the audience to sort of like, oh, Dick's okay. And obviously we all knew Dick was going to be fine. But well, like, yeah. A storytelling. You know. but, but at the same time, yeah, it's this, you know, they've, they're they a little bit in too over their heads and it's gotten out of their control. And here comes here comes Batman Which, to relieve you know, all of that. For I did say last week when we talked about Batman, the, the, the mm-hmm. book, and it kind of implied that he might be popping back in t- towards yeah. the end of this. I didn't really like the idea of Batman coming in to like need, need him needing to be able to fix it, um, and I still don't like. I kind of wish it would then just play I, out and let the the Bat family deal with it on their mm-hmm. own. But I can't deny the moments well done. Yeah, and I, I don't feel like he's the missing piece. I feel like him, he's just more chaos going on in there. You know, I feel like he's not just going to save the day just because he's Batman. This is still going to be a team effort. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, we'll see how they know, play they just, that. Yeah. Next issue. Yeah. But... They just have their actual team captain now, you know, to, to help guide the way. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, again, they didn't even account. Maybe this is part of Tamaki's storytelling is like Scarecrow was the piece they didn't even account for. And that's what led everything to go to, go to shit, you know, and now Batman's here, which, you know, we can, do whatever and, and clean up all of that through through that. So you know it could work yeah. its way out. There's still two issues left. And nothing would um, thrill me more if Batman just sort of like lets them take the lead and says, "Okay, yeah. what's the mission? What are we doing here? Where do you need me?" And just yep. follows their orders effectively. Mm-hmm. That that would actually please me if they did that. If they don't, it won't piss me off. But it would it would yeah, be a nice no. sentiment to mm-hmm. to go on. Um, yeah, uh, art art's really solid. I know, and you hoping yep. doing fun stuff. Uh, yep. kind of obviously it's very similar to the last issue. Which mm-hmm. they also did. Um, I particularly like the you know the last page, the the dark moody room that Psycho Pirate and the yeah. Canals wife are in. You, you've got that, you know, the red door light. opening with Anna Volsians coming in. So you get the the red light going across uh, the <laughs> wife's face. You know, just just details like that are really good. Yeah. Uh, nice mix of color palettes, depending if we're in a moody room outside with a night city lights and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. uh, it's it's been good stuff. Um. So, oh, good. Uh, all right. So we'll go to the backup then. Uh, mm-hmm. when we're still in no man's land with our character. Yep. And he is leading Croc and his little team. They're going to steal the food back off some thugs that have stolen the basically the emergency supplies that have been dropped into Gotham, uh, mm-hmm. for the civilians, and they're going to steal them back. Uh, so there's a bit of a fight. They 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 take the food. They take it to, um. What's her face? Leslie Tompkins. I have to think about uh-huh. her. Uh, and Leslie's like, I'm a little conflicted about where you're getting this stuff from. I really don't like the Crocs here, but, <coughs> you know, my patients are hungry and we don't have a lot of options right now. So, you know, let's, let's do it. Uh, but our main character says, okay, we're running out of places to look for food. And she leads her to Helena. Right, So we get Huntress mm-hmm. in this. And Huntress says, hey, there's a spot here where you can maybe go get some, steal some food from the, the train yards or whatever. And he takes his little team down to this area to to find this these potential supplies, but when they get there, it's actually a trap, and Huntress is waiting for them, and so is Batman. And we effectively get finally like now you know part ten of this twelve part story, we get him facing off with Batman, and sort of saying what he thinks of Batman to his face. And Batman at first like he, he does set this up knowing who it is. He's kind of like here to like stop this gang of thugs who are going around and stealing stuff. But when he realizes it's him, he says, no, stand down. This is the person I failed to save. And he admits that to him and says, look, as long as you're not hurting anyone, as long as you're you're not stealing from people who need things, we'll let this pass. But uh, when this is all over, this is done. And uh, of course, yeah, you know, the, the kid accuses him of working with child soldiers. I've seen them. They've mm-hmm. attacked me <laughs> and things like that. Uh, so... He had his his kid army basically there, uh, which I thought was a great visual of them mm-hmm. standing there with their spears, uh, very post apocalyptic vibes. 
Yeah, um, I, I suppose in a lot of ways, I, I, you know, wherever we end with this, at least right now, we're getting this idea of, like, it's what he says here, is that we are Gotham, we're the ones that Gotham mm-hmm. forgets, and that even to Batman, there's people who fall yep. through the cracks, because even he can't, like, take care right. of everyone. He's proof of that, right? Like, despite Bruce's best efforts to try to take care of this kid, he got lost in the system, and, you know, I, I love that this kid does not hesitate when Batman shows up, and he just wallops him with his stick. Mm. It, you know, it, it's just shown that how he's grown from being completely terrified of Batman to he's in survival mode. He's got a very um, strong moral stance as well. He's very yep. specific about not hurting people and only mm-hmm. taking from those who are bad and right. giving to people in need. You know, like, this is not a villain, right? We're at a point now where he is not a villain by any right. means. And right. that's kind of interesting to sort of see the dynamic of. I will say, obviously, the art typically with this has been very good. Yep. But... I will say there is a couple of panels here with some weird proportions going on. Uh, the panel, w- or the page where... So Batman shows up, and then the page after that, the panel at the bottom, uh, where it's Batman and Huntress in the panel, and Batman says, get ready. Uh, like, there's a weird, like... He's so bulky. Yeah, there's like a weird bulkiness that makes his head look tiny. <laughs> there's yeah. something weird going on there with the proportions, but... yeah. Uh, it's, I feel I feel bad because typically speaking, the art is very nice to look at, and it's got wonderful yeah. inks and the color schemes. I, are really I'm good. almost though wondering if it's Blanco doing a little bit of an homage to the Batman of that era. Oh, maybe yeah. You know, because you look at his Batman throughout, and he's bulky. Like he definitely looks like a bodybuilder version of Batman compared to what we've seen Batman before, which is more. You know, I wonder if we if we would go back and look, there'd be these subtle changes. Uh, through time, but uh, I don't know. Very, very um, possibly. Uh, it is interesting seeing Huntress in an old school outfit as well. Mm-hmm. Like obviously having fun with some of that stuff. Right. Uh, so again, like I, I'm curious if this, if they ever get an, because maybe that's not the whole point of this is that he's unnamed because he's just meant to represent a lot of people, right. so he's never going to get right. a name. Uh, because right. because I think early on we were like, oh, who's going to turn out to be? And I'm right. not convinced there's going to be a. No, once once they threw him off of a bridge. Um, I was kind of like, oh no, he is a representative of, of the idea of Gotham almost, and now it's no, he's the forgotten of Gotham, um, and I and I just I do like how this is a story on how kind of despite Batman's best efforts, he can't save everybody, and that you know this kid's asked how to figure it out for himself, um, so but yeah, it's just it's still the highlight. I feel like as good as. As good as as the the tower has been, I really look forward to this one every every week. Yeah. Uh, all right. I guess we'll we'll read the main story for me, Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh, main story seven point five. Seven point five and the backup. Eight. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to go with a nice solid eight on the main story, uh, and I'll probably say a solid eight on the backup as well. Uh, there you go. So yeah, detective uh, keeping strong as it has been for quite some time. So cool. Uh, Superman, Son of Kal-El, issue 9. Tom Taylor writing with Bruno Redondo on the art. So, uh, obviously it's the second part of the crossover with Nightwing. And I guess the only critique I would really have of this, Mm -hmm. and I feel like if Connor was here, he would be sitting and rambling about this for like 10 minutes, Mm -hmm. is that it hasn't really been a crossover per se, as it's just been two issues of Superman that happens to feature Nightwing that they decide to have one issue be just of Nightwing instead of just being both of them Superman. <laughs> yeah, but this one has Redondo art. The last one had Redondo art as well. Yeah, that's what I mean. This is... So this is a Superman issue with Redondo art. True, yes, okay. I, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, that's yeah. a plus. So like, yeah, so that's a plus. Um, because no, it, you're, you're absolutely right. This, it doesn't, this almost... Because this is the thing. Just, it doesn't have an ending. It's, it's not like a two-parter where no. there's an ending. This is just setting up where we're going in Superman. I almost felt like this could have been like an annual. For, for sure. For, yeah, I could see that. For, for Superman's and Nicole. So instead of the Luther issue that we got, having this team up with Nightwing, this feels very much like a annual size story yeah. but that luther story was really good though so i guess yeah. i i can't really complain that they em- they found a way to give us both you know <laughs> embarrassment of riches right like in fact i thought this was a night week issue because i'm not too good at reading sometimes um yeah ma, and- ma said to me something about yeah. reading nightwing and then yeah. i went to check my best like, wait nightwing came out this yeah. week where's nightwing have i missed a book <laughs> because of the redondo art i just assumed i didn't even look at the cover Right. Um, I knew it was a crossover. Um, 
And I was like, this is a weird issue of like John narrating throughout Nightwing. Weird, weird thing, but it's all Tom Taylor. It's fine. And it's like, oh no, this is Superman son of Kal El. <laughs> yeah, I don't have fun with this. I like this more than the the, the, the first half mm-hmm. for this. Yeah. Uh, well this this felt like a more complete story almost where the other one was just kind of leading to this. Um so they kind of feel un unbalanced because I feel like all the really good stuff's in, in this one. Yeah, so basically Dick is working on his own, taking down criminals in Metropolis because they're mm-hmm. trying to lure in these super these uh serial these super power serial killers, mm-hmm. <laughs> for lack of a better term. Crazy. Um, uh Dick is basically acting as bait. Uh so we get some fun sequences of him fighting some guys. I love the two page layout where he grapples up to the roof behind him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the building that he's grappled up to, they use that for panels inside of it. A uh, yep. really, really nice page. Um, but best thing, though, uh, maybe my favorite panel of the whole issue, is that they throw Dick off the roof, thinking they're killing him. And then, obviously, the, you turn the page, and John's flying up. And Nightwing has just got his hands behind his head, and he's got his legs crossed <laughs> as yep. he's falling down, just looking so cocky. It's such a great panel. <laughs> he's so relaxed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Superman goes up and obviously fights them. Uh, Maddox is freaking out. Why is Superman here? He was because you know, they've basically tricked the system because they knew they'd been monitoring Superman. Right. And uh, like, are you going to help Nightwing? He's like, ah, he doesn't need saving, and he just throws his uh his stick over, and Nightwing mm-hmm. uses his wingsuit and then grapples. It's just a nice little sequence. It's, it's, it's like a lot of what they've been doing with the little uh small panel showing yeah showing the yeah. how tos. Again, very Daredevil, very. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sam the Daredevil. Uh, so, yeah, so Nightwing comes up and they, they beat up the bad guys. Uh, two of them go away. They've put a tracker on one. They know they're going to the Luther building and there's like a big sub-basement level that's lined in lead and all the rest of it. But the big thing here is that the one that they have kept behind, the leader of this little group, John still got him and they're going to talk to him, interrogate him and whatever. But Maddox, of course, having foreseen this type of situation... Bendix. Sorry, Bendix. Yeah. Who's Maddox? Maddox I, I don't something. know. I mean, Maddox, uh, one of my favorite uh, pitchers of all time, Maddox, <laughs> but I don't know where you would pull it's that just, from. It's just a brain fart, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So Bendix is, is planned for this kind of thing and basically just kills the guy. Like, he has like a self-destruct thing in his head. And the really sad part of it is that clearly these people in this, these team in The Rising are being completely mind-controlled, as we've seen, right? They're being completely mm-hmm. controlled in every way. It's, it's not even their own voices or their own words coming out. And seemingly right before this guy dies, the way he says Superman with the question mark implies that for a second before he dies, he is himself again. Uh-huh. So he did die as himself. Like, he, he goes back to being who he is for a second and dies. And it's just this really sad, sad beat. And then you, you get that hug panel where John just hugs Nightwing at the end of the, yeah, the scene. Yeah, so they're, they're surrounded by the sparks of what used to be this guy. And yeah, it's just the, the blues and purples. And just everything, and then he just hugs Dick, and it's oh man, yeah. Uh, so now, really well done scene, really good stuff. Uh, and then we go to the Kent house, uh, in which Lois tries her best to remain faithful to Clark, even though young Dick Grayson is walking around in a t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> I'm just cracking a joke. Because the ladies love Dick. What can I say? Uh, uh, but she's uh, happy he's there and looking out for John and. Uh, Dick gives her a job offer and says, hey, do you want to be the head of the truth? Because it needs some legitimacy. It needs a person who's actually it got some a press. face. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's the other thing. It needs a face. It needs someone who, like, if it's anonymous, there's like a sort of air of mystique about it, which they don't right. want. You need someone who can actually be the face of it. And uh, and who better than Lois, right? Yeah. Like, it's out now that Superman's Clark Kent, that they're, you know, that she's married to him. And, like, why not, right? This this would add ultimate legitimacy to it. Yeah, uh, so Dick goes to speak to John. And they have this really sweet conversation how, because Nightwing saved him once, and that was the flashback at the start of uh, uh-huh. uh, the, the last issue, he talks about how, and this is a great use of like recent continuity here, mm-hmm. he talks about how when he was trapped in the other you know planet, in the other dimension or whatever, when he was aged up effectively to us, and he was there for five years, you know, aged 11 to 16. 16. He talks about how there was times when he was there and it was so horrible that he still thought to himself, 
I really hope Nightwing swoops in and saves me. Like, I hope Nightwing saves me. And Nightwing, of course, is like, oh, you know, I'm sorry, but... And obviously it's not his fault, because, t- I mean, to everyone else, like, a couple of weeks passed. And for, for John, it was years. Mm-hmm. But uh, it feels like this really sweet moment. Um, and he offers to be a mentor. And then there's all the shenanigans where uh, Jay comes running in the room through the wall. <laughs> I, do, I do love him phasing through the wall. And uh, Dick's reaction to that is he grabs a, a stuffed mammoth uh, to use it as a weapon. Uh, like, what, what were you going to do with a stuffed mammoth? I kind of like <laughs> the idea as well, is that the reason why it's a stuffed mammoth is because because of the, the aging up where mm-hmm. like time moves so quickly there's just a lot of still of john's like kid Kitty. stuff lying around yeah because he's not just he's not really had time yeah. he's like get rid of it all and care about and, it and i know that the metropolis ice hockey team are the mammoths so i like ah. to think that it's it's mammoths merch but you know uh, probably more akin to your your <laughs> but still i mean um, it can be both that could be why yeah. it has a mammoth as a kid yeah, but i i love that that you know Dick grabs that as a weapon, and Lois just comes in with a massive laser gun. Yeah, so that's massive. It's obvious. It's something Clark had kicking about in the fortress, yeah. you know, that he confiscated. Uh huh. And Lois comes in with it, uh, and then it's like, okay, just uh, John's like, Jay, just tell them who you are, because there's, there's no point in hiding all this shit. And he's like, yeah, I'm the leader of the truth, and basically, uh, they're, they're they're trying to spin that John killed this guy because the the mm-hmm. footage that's just you know high up helicopter shot of this guy exploding in John's hands. They're making it look like John's the one who killed him. So it's like, okay, we have to combat this, and that's when Lois accepts the, the job of becoming the head of the truth to sort of... But I mean, yep. she has incentive. Like She's trying to like protect her son's reputation because now they're calling him a murderer. Uh, yeah, but I like how Dick frames it to her. He's like, Lois, you ready to st- uh, want to stop on some lies? Because that's what Lois Lane's all about, right? Like, she's out there to reveal things. And, you know, it's just a bonus that it happens now to you know, to be a better son. And then Dick gives John a lollipop to end the yep. issue because that ties mm-hmm. back into the to the, the flashback and because John was saying how Nightwing was his hero. Uh, it's all very sweet. There's a lot of feels, lots of heartwarming things. There's some really inventive layouts mm-hmm. and panels when they're fighting the, the rising. I love uh, both yep. Dick going up to the building and then the, the falling from the building with a smug look in his face. All of that stuff yep. is wonderful. Uh, seeing, you know, we don't get to see a lot of characters like Dick Grayson and Lois Lane interacting, so it's kind of nice to see it once in a while like this. Yeah. So, that's cool. Um, yeah. uh, I love the idea as well, just in general, that Dick is like this close friend of the family because Superman likes Dick. And, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and Well, he was, and, and I also like, too, that, like, it's always been said that Dick always looks up to Clark a little bit more than Bruce, because Bruce is like his dad, but... Uh, Clark is more like his, not like an, an uncle, but more like an actual mentor that Dick sought out. Um, and then now Dick gets to repay that by being Clark's son's Plus, like, as, mentor and hero. And as they point out in this issue, they both, like the, the, the two people in the universe that actually recognize that Damien Wayne's not a shithead. <laughs> yep. like, yep, yep. Yeah, we both like Damien. That's, we're kind of in a unique club. <laughs> yeah. So I do love, you know, it's, it's, you know, these two can bridge the Bat and Super families really well. Yeah. Oh, and that's the other thing I like is uh, when John's straight up just asking about when Dick was Batman and him then yeah. Dick talking about, like, feeling, no, I was, like, I never felt like I was really living up I, to it. He was, uh, he never, you know, he was, as you know, you know, us Bat folk don't really have superpowers, but I found out mine is I had super imposter syndrome, um, which I, I really like that too, because he always felt like I'm not, I don't deserve to be Batman, I'm just pretending to be super or to be batman and you know i feel like that's the a thread that john's learning throughout superman you know while his dad's gone so uh, yeah and and let's face it you know as much as they're not literally father and son but we often look at dick as a son of batman in a lot of ways he is yeah he's not his blood son but he is his oldest son you know it's it's Uh, that that father figure and try to fill the father's Mm -hmm. shoes is definitely something that can relate to what john's going through yep so no, that, like, them having this bonding over all this just makes complete sense. It feels fulfilling to have the characters be sort of doing this mm-hmm. and taking it this way. Um, it's just another example of Taylor understanding these characters and how we should move forward with them. That feels just, it just feels right mm-hmm. the whole time to me. So, 
Yeah, it's cool. I mean, really, the only critique you could have is that it's market is a two issue crossover, and honestly, you get to the end of this issue, you're like, oh no, this is just like leading into the next issue of Superman. So it's not, it's not really. It's more like Dick guested in a a two two issues of Superman, and he's going to be probably uh, referenced a few times here or there because he's yeah. he's the one owning the truth now, and mm-hmm. he's he's related to that a little bit. But the fact that one of the issues happened to be a Nightwing issue is almost irrelevant. It's just two yeah. issues of Superman, and that's okay. I mean, that's fine. Yeah. If you're reading Superman and like it, yeah. Uh, as someone who likes likes both books because I like everything Tom Taylor's writing, pretty much, uh, I have no issue with that, but. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the only objective critique I think you could give this as a as a two part crossover. Yeah. Well, and now we're getting another uh two parter with uh Nightwing and Wally West for the next one. So Yeah, I'm not against that either. <laughs> no. But that that I feel that's two Nightwing issues. I don't feel like yeah, it's that's not... crossing over with Flash. So you know, we'll we'll get back. So it's not really a crossover, that... it's just Wally's in two issues of Nightwing. Yeah, yeah, it's a Wally featuring, that's what I meant to say. But yeah. like the last issue of Nightwing before this, with you know when the Teen Titans show up, and all of that, that that's that's what I'm here for. Like I want I want to get more onto the whole you know Dick Grayson billionaire thing that uh, Taylor is doing, but if he's stopping and taking some time and doing these spotlight issues to show how important Dick is to the greater DC universe. How am I supposed to be mad at that? You know, yeah. now he is he's Superman's mentor now, right? Like that's really cool. Yeah, there's nothing. As a, as a fan of Dick Grayson, as a fan of John Kent, there's nothing that I don't like about what they're mm-hmm. doing with this relationship. I love it. Heartwarming to the yep. to the nth degree. So, uh, and, you know, we mentioned DR, of course, is phenomenal. Redondo's Redondo. next level. Like, he's one of my favorite artists, probably doing, like, ongoing comics right now. Yep, easily. So, no, that's cool. What you're rating Superman, Son of Kal-El, issue 9. Uh, I'm going to give this an 8.5. Well, that seems fair to me. Um, yeah. I think I'll agree. I'm almost tempted to go with a nine. And the only reason why I'm not is just because of the weird kind of crossover, not yeah. really a crossover in this of it. But uh, I generally really like a lot of what it's doing. So really good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's cool. Trial of the Amazons, issue one, which has four writers, I think, which I didn't write down because there was too many of them. Yeah, it's... Basically, everyone that's been working on a on a uh, Amazon book, you got you got uh, Conrad and um, Clunin out here. Who? Clunin. Yeah, Conrad and Clunin. You got Joel Jones. You have Stephanie Phillips and Vida Ayala. I think those are the four. All right. Um, well, it's five, and, I think. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so you have you have the the Wonder Woman team, the Nubia team, and the Wonder Girl team. Yes. Uh, and then whoever was doing the backups and all this. And so I, I read everything to lead up to this. I was reading the backups and this still, I was still very, I don't want to say lost cause I wasn't lost. Just a lot. It feels like there's a lot going on that was just informed by those backups. And if you weren't reading everything, I feel like you're not getting the full picture. Well, I shall jump in here at this point. <laughs> so I tried reading this. I did not finish it. Um, I read, you know, a handful of pages. I really was like, just not feeling anything from anything I was reading. Yep. And then I skimmed through the rest and I saw, okay, so it's basically one by one, like Yara shows up eventually and Diana shows up. I saw the cliffhanger at the end, which, oh, you know, it seems like a fine cliffhanger to start your big, you know, mm-hmm. Amazon event on is the you know, Hippolyta seems to be dead. So yep. there's been a murder, effectively. Okay, and, and that makes sense because it's called Trial of the Amazon, so there's going to be a trial. That makes sense. Right? That's a double entendre, though, because sure. there's also, you know, you, you remember the beginning of uh, One Woman 84? You know, how, could I, how could I forget? That's what this feels like they're paying homage to, and I don't think that's a good thing. Oh, but... dear. That's the other trial of the Amazons that's going on. Uh, it, it felt, to me, it was just kind of this... There's a lot of characters talking, and I just I don't necessarily feel like I'm getting like key points from what they're saying. No, and all of the voices are roughly the same. Yeah, like the only difference. So every Bana McDowell Amazon sounds the same. To which I started to question which one's Queen Faruka, because every time Atalanta talked, it felt like that was also Queen Faruka, um, which is a problem when you have this many characters that most people are being introduced to. 
yeah, I it just it felt messy to me. It felt like it needed to be streamlined a little bit and obviously I was dubious going into this because like it yeah. was a crossover with all these teams based on a lot of books that I wasn't reading that I'd already mm-hmm. decided not to read for various reasons. So it wasn't a surprise to me that I ended up not liking it and not finishing yeah. it, but I mean, I mean, from here on, you actually read the whole issue, so I'll let you take yeah. it from here. Yeah, so I'll, but... I'll, I'll cover this and Nubia because that was the part two, which I think was a mistake um, because it feels like making no, no, just issue to, six... Ju- yeah, just to reiterate, the Nubia issue that is part two of this cr- this event crossover is its final issue of its own miniseries. Yeah, which it's... From what I can gather, everything was wrapped up in, in issue five. So this should have been like the newbie special for mm. trial of the Amazons, like they're doing with wonder girl. Right. Like, um, so in, in trial of the Amazons, you have the Bana McDoll showing up, uh, to Themyscira to challenge the Themyscirians, uh, over the title of keeper of doom's doorway. So like, as, as we learned through uh, other Wonder Woman books, I can't remember if this goes all the way back to Rekka at Rebirth or if this was other writers throwing in there, that Themyscira sits on top of the entrance to the underworld. That's how they were able to keep Ares there. And that the person that's guarded or the person that's chosen to guard Doom's doorway is almost the same importance as like Diana, who was elected to go into Man's World. And so up till... Up until Hippolyta left, Nubia was the guardian of Doom's Doorway. And so when she was elected Queen of the Amazons and Hippolyta left to join the Justice League, with Diana being gone, they've had almost a rotating amount of Amazonians, which is what the Band of Migdal have taken umbrage with, is that, if I don't know if you remember, Pete, when I would talk about the backup, they had the Chimera attack, and they said that all the... the the Muscarians sent it because they, they see we're a threat. That gets brought up again, but it's almost as D- if... Just to answer the question, I definitely yes. do not remember. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, so you have this, this monster attack them. They repel it uh, because, you know, Banner McDowell is, is full. Those Amazonians are fully in man's world. Uh, so they show up and they, you know, because of this uh, Chimera attack, the, they think that the Muscarians sent it to them. But it comes to find out that they decide that, no, the Themyscirians are doing such a bad job, we're going to challenge to have one of the Banna McDoll guard Doom's Doorway. Which then leads to, of course, yeah, Nubia having issues because you're coming here, you know. They're not supposed to be able to get through and bring their weapons in. They do anyways. Uh, it's a complete culture clash. And as Nubia and Faruka, the two queens of these respective Amazonian groups, as they're fighting... Uh, Donna Troy and and Cassie show up with the Esca, Escasita, who are um, Wonder Girls tribe that that came from the Amazons. Which reminded me, I never finished Wonder Girl. Uh, that, that <laughs> you never read issue. the last issue. <laughs> yeah, I never got to it. Um, so I'm I'm assuming everything goes well, and she rejects the 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 Greek gods and ends up back with with her own people so it seemed to be going that way from where yeah I left off. so so yara shows up and they they also want to make a play for for guarding because they're they're tied into this now for whatever reason which i'm sure if i had read seven would have been more clear um so as, as they're deciding this uh nubia uh, or faruka and nubia are going at it and they say uh faruka also throws out there's like well then also let, let's add into this that whoever wins the trial uh, to, to guard, you know, the Doom's Doorway also becomes the the leader of all the Amazons, which would, of course, give up Themyscira to everyone else. And Nubia, you know, makes that decision. Um, they're trying to honor Diana. They're going to do this trial, which is this whole, you know, um, like I said, the, the beauty of Wonder Woman 84 to where there'll be three different feats. They all have to be uh, voted on by each member of, of the different Amazon groups, um, and each of them get get a representative. Uh, it's very Triwizard Tournament from uh, Harry Potter, it seems like, because they all can't be the same event. They has to showcase the different, you know, strengths of the different tribes, and um, uh, you know, so they're deciding all of this, and while they're doing this, 
But Paula goes because she's no longer queen. She's still very much revered. She's happy her daughter's back. And she goes off with her, I would guess, spouse, uh, Philippus, which I guess this is, you know, correct me if I'm wrong out there, dear listeners. Uh, this is the first confirmation that we have that Hippolyta and Philippus, who was the woman that trained uh, Diana, uh, were an actual couple. But they retreat back to their quarters and... Philippus is saying how, you know, she doesn't like all this going on, but they have to respect the customs. And, you know, Hippolyta's like, well, we just have to trust that Nubia, that's why, you know, she was made queen of the Amazons. And she's like, well, Philippus, you you go out and, and you know, take in some some air and we'll we'll do this. Uh, that's when we get word that Hippolyta has been killed in her quarters. Uh, while Philippus is gone, it looks like she might have drank some poison. Um, and that's where this issue ends. Uh, it gets into Nubia, which is just everything we just saw almost from Nubia's point of view and how it ties up some of the stuff that I'm guessing happened in that book with Medusa, who came through the the, the doorway, who, you know, Medusa, the famous snake haired lady, now looks like a typical Amazonian um, and that she's been changed by by her time in Themyscira. And now, you know, she's paid her price. She's no longer a Gorgon. She's now, you know, a member of the the group. But of course, everyone suspects her because she used to be a monster. And that somehow the group of Amazonians get together and decide that the person that was going to be in the trial also can't be responsible for the death of Hippolyta. So there's someone in there that just has vengeance on their mind. And it's all just very messy. And it ends with Diana coming to Nubia saying like, well, we're going to get to the bottom of this. I have to use the lasso and we're going to get the truth out of everybody. And it's just like, man, there's so many different things going on in this book. Um, again, with this Nubia one, it just feels like this should have been a special and not issue six, right? Like I'm almost upset that I had to pick up issue six of a mini series. That's actually just a, that doesn't, you know, uh, it's it almost a, like it's a five issue miniseries and then there's, and then there's an issue six as well. <laughs> well, no, well not even that because like that doesn't impact me whatsoever it almost felt like this Nubia issue just is they were just throwing out there to have an extra issue you could have put all this stuff you could have cleared up stuff in Trial of the Amazons and put that in there instead of having two books out you know and let the Nubia book have its extra sixth you know or maybe it was uh, just a five issue like you said and yeah. but why tag it onto here it's weird or just, or just call it, like... I mean, if anything, it's annoying that it's they're doing all this crossover stuff. Like, mm-hmm. just, just have it be Trial of the Amazons 1-6 to or 1-5 to or, or right. whatever. Like <laughs> Right. And so, and now this is going to end up Wonder Woman, which I was enjoying. And now it's like, well, do I want to read it? But it's... Everything's so messy because there's a murder plot. There's the trial plot. There's the Banner McDowell who seem like they're not going to play by the rules. You have the Escasita who... Who knows how they're going to play into all of this? They're just there now. Because um, I never finished. It's It might have been in there and I might have skimmed over it because this book took me... I started it Wednesday and I did not finish it till yesterday on a Friday. So it took me three days to get through all of this because I would stop and start. And I'm like, what else do I have to read at this point? Uh, and go back, read Urban Legends and, and stuff. So... Yeah, man. Um, maybe it's in there. They explained it better, and I'm just forgetting because of the the, the piecemeal way I, I read this one. But it all just feels very messy, and it almost feels like the an event for the sake of an event, mm-hmm. which those are never good. Like, if you're going to do it, I want the story to feel like it's justified, and this kind of just it doesn't. Um, and it sucks because I wanted, I wanted Nubia as they introduced that character. What was that back in Future State? Oh yeah, I think it was another backup of that, like something. Yeah, it was like the backup like of Wonder Woman book. Yeah, yeah, because that felt like it was gonna do some of this like fun mythological stuff and where she comes from and how she's you know not quite a typical Amazon. And here she's almost just a typical Amazon, and it makes her you know besides being queen, it doesn't make her feel that special at all, which kind of sucks because um, mm. that's not what we got in the two issues that I enjoyed. You know. Um, and then just her series ended up, ended up being a mini, almost just felt like they dropped the ball somewhere. Um, we know the mess that's going on with Wonder Woman, or with Wonder Girl, rather. 
and how they cut the last two issues of those and tied them into this. Um, so yeah, man, I, I don't know. Maybe depending on what else is out next week, maybe I'll try Wonder Woman, but it, it's tying into this and I, I kind of like, yes, I want to know who killed Hippolyta, but I don't kind of care who's going to win the trial to guard Doom's Story because it doesn't feel like it's going to matter at all. And I know that that's a, a crappy justification for wanting to read something, but looking forward in the in the previews, right, and the solicits, we kind of know that whatever the next Wonder Woman story that's going to pick up kind of doesn't deal with any of the fallout from this, right? It just feels like it's picking up that thread of who was on Themyscira before from the annual. So I don't know. Um, like like Pete said earlier, maybe this just should have been where the or trial of the Amazons one through six. And, you know, just when you think Wonder Woman's getting her, her act together in that section of the DC, some of this comes over and kind of upsets the cart. I mean, so. the good news is, is that when this is over, it's returning to a plot in Wonder Woman that I think we were yeah. all into from the annual yeah. or whatever. I think it was the annual anyway. Yeah. Set up this. It was. Yeah. So uh, yeah. hopefully, hopefully, uh, we can enjoy that the time comes. Uh, what are you rate in Trail of the Amazons, though? So, so Trail of the Amazons, because it's such a, a slap shot, like, there are four different artists, you know, a bunch of different writers. The voices are all off. I'm going to have to give it a five. Whoa. There yeah. you go. All right. Well, there, there, there it is. Uh, all right. Well, I, I arranged things to give your voice a break, because I knew you'd be talking yeah. a lot in that, yep. and then what's coming up after. So I am going to take this time to talk about... Bad Girls issue four, uh, Becky Clooney and Michael Conrad writing with Jorge Corona on the art. So Matt and Carter both dropped off of this. Um, I like the characters enough, and I'm enjoying parts of it enough that I wanted to keep reading it. Although acknowledging some of his problems uh, and the narration and all the witty meta things the narration's trying to do is still there, and I'll talk about a couple of those in this. Uh. You know, it's it's funny because like they set up like okay, we're going to go after um the guy who's using the fear toxin to control people, you know, tonight. Uh, the the the, 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 tutor. the tutor. Yeah, yeah. we're going to go after him. So have the day off, back girls, and go do stuff. So Steph and Cass go to a bookstore locally when they're out for a walk, and uh, the it's one of the neighbors that owns the bookstore, and Cass gets a book from the guy, some adventure book, and it's, it's all, you know, there's some fun banter in here and stuff going on, and Steph being suspicious of the other old neighbor who comes in to buy some books, because uh, she thinks he's the serial killer. And it's like, again, I still kind of like a lot of the threads that are going on, but it is maybe spinning too many things at once, because you, you've got this in the first part of the book, and Steph then follows him, because she wants to follow him and see if he does anything suspicious. But then she bumps into the guy that was at the party thing last issue, who Babs knows, and has an awkward interaction with him. And then when they go out to go look for the tutor, they get tailed by the, the group of villains that uh, the seer is sent, you know, the saints that, that that are sending after them. Mm-hmm. So there's like so many things spinning. And I was actually thinking during this issue that. Honestly, an issue like this where a lot of these things converge could be really fun if, like, each of the elements had a few issues on their own to, like, set each of the things up. And then it would feel like, okay, they're all set up in the world, so when they all start converging, it could feel really fun. But right from issue one, like, all of these things have been introduced concurrently and all kind mm-hmm. of going at the same time. It, it's a bit overwhelming. Uh, there is some fun stuff, though. Like, there's a great full page spread in the middle where it's uh, Steph and Cass in costume and they're, like, jumping down from a building. And... Oracle at the end of the previous page sort of makes it clear, you know, keep things quiet out there, we're going full stealth. And Steph then just blabbers on the next page, all over it. Minimal chatter, not gonna even say it, you know, we know how it's done. Sneaky, silent, two bats in the night. We've mastered the element of surprise. It's just sort of monologuing. Mm-hmm. And then you hear Oracle go, Steph, and then Cash just goes, ha ha. <laughs> and Steph goes, see, Batgirl thinks it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of good little bantery moments like that that are kind of what makes it work and I, I love the suspicions of like the neighbor who might be a serial killer that stuff is great and uh, I, I really enjoy that uh so they're looking for the tutor they, they've traced them to this location he knows they're coming he, he was aware there was a tracker uh the, ultimately this all boils down to when they're in the bookstore uh, the the book the the owner refers to them as besties. Uh, you're oh, you're the two new besties who who moved in. 
And when they leave the store, Cass asks what does besties mean? And Steph goes, no, it's not our best friends, and Nick sort of explains it. Uh, and it all builds up to kind of a sweet moment later when, even though they've got filters in their masks, uh, Steph does overcome to the, the talks and stuff, and does get turned briefly, and Cass effectively talks her down and says, you know, I need you, you're my best friend, and hugs her, and that's what kind of snaps her out of it. So there is kind of a nice little payoff there that's kind of sweet with Cass. Uh, I, I like that. I like that work quite well. Uh, and, and then, though, right after this moment, the, the, the meta narration stuff has to come in and kind of really... So, Steph, like, has a big couple of speech bubbles, but it's covered by the narration boxes. And it's like the narrator says, So, yeah, Steph is using some justifiably strong vocabulary here to quote famous French philosopher and then, like, you know, basically says what she's essentially saying and at the end goes, And we'll leave to your imagination what Steph's dialogue is. And I'm like, stop being cute. Like, <laughs> she's just annoying me stop it yeah uh there's also there's a moment earlier on as well where the the, the narration references stuff that happened in last issues and I, I think it says something like oh so if you're still reading this and on ps thank you for reading you're great uh and then there's kind of editor's note ha- asterisk and then you go to read the editor's note and it's the editor saying and you're fine connoisseurs of art you know editor and i'm like stop it you're doing meta yeah. upon meta here stop it you're doing too much cute things with like talking to the audience stop like it. I, I like the just by the way you described it the the first part with you know a string of, of you know philosophy but we know she's just foul mouthing somebody yeah. right like, yeah i kind of like that that's kind of funny the editor's note if you're still reading that like that you're somehow negating well, yeah. yourself. The if you're still reading is not the editor's note. That's in the narration. And then there's an editor note as well on top of that. Oh, so I thought they were doing an editor's note on an editor's note to no. be cute. <laughs> oh, I like that even less. That it's actually in the dialogue. Well, it's Oof. in the narration. It's not no, the, ca- in the narration. Yeah, the That's characters. And it's third person, so it's not maybe a character who's saying it. Uh, right. But I don't want the writer to talk to me as if they're the writer, as if they're actually the comic book writer. Right. Like, if you're going to do third-person narration, be an unseen narrator who is om- well, not ominous, uh, omnis- omniscient is the word I'm looking yeah. for. Omniscient. Omniscient. Thank you. That's the, that's the word Got it. that I can't say. Uh, so, yeah, the Saints are still sort of following them, and uh, they're, they've, they've tied up uh, to her, and they're, they're taking them back to, to base. Oh, actually, sorry, they're taking them to... Th- Babs is saying, no, take, take them here uh, to to be analyzed and it turns out it's the it's the guy who they were joking was our ex from the last issue that steph ran into uh they take him to his place and he's going to help sort of check out the tutor but then of course the the cliffhanger of the issue is after the bat girls leave is that this guy's of course he's a villain he's, he's got the tutor strapped to a chair uh and he's monologuing and he says you failed me tutor is it how many times do i have to tell you during our lessons, I am no longer Charles Dante. That was his name. Because, I, I, I mean, whatever. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm Spellbinder. And he's got all these two horns that came out of this mask that he's wearing in the last page. So big, big reveal at the end. So we have the tour. We have Spellbinder. We have Seer. We have the Saints. We have a serial killer going around. <laughs> there's, there's too much. Calm yourself. Calm down. And you have three main characters. I mean, I'm okay with that, but... <laughs> no, I know, but yeah. now you add all of them, too, and it's like, there's a lot. I think one villain that they're like they're focusing on as Batgirls, plus the mm-hmm. serial killer mystery, which is mostly comic relief with them... More than enough. Because I, 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 I like the serial killer thing, because it's this comic relief thing for Steph and Cass to do during the day, and it's mostly right. been funny. So I like that paired with, yeah. like, a, a main villain plot. Well, but you're juggling... It, it feels like, rear windowy, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a fun Batgirl's rear window. But then you're juggling four main villains, so, like... I'm still going to read the next one, but there, there is kind of, like, a, a an element of, like, when I start reading this and go, oh, this is a lot of words I'm reading here. Um, I, like, you know, there's a little bit of that. I, I, I tend to be okay once I get going, but, it, like, there, there are some rough elements to this, and I really hope it calms yeah. down a little... Uh, as it goes but uh but, but you know i yeah so I, I i hope it i hope it can smooth out a little bit but there are things in there i do like and the art is still fun and fits the the vibe that it's going for stuff like steph with a little love heart like sunglasses like like peering out of them and like looking over bookcases and stuff and 
being suspicious of things. It's all very hijinksy, and I kind of, you know, I have fun with that stuff. Yeah. So, uh, I will give this... I will give this a... I want to give it, I'll give it a 7. I'll stretch this 7. I, I want it to maybe go a little bit lower, but I still really yeah. like the stuff I liked a lot. So I'll, I will stretch to a 7, but it's, it's a shaky 7. Shaky 7. Uh, so there you go. And actually, no, I put that in your box. You didn't rate that 7. I rated that 7. I did not. Yeah. So fixing that right now. All right. Batman Urban Legends, issue 13. You read some of this, or all of it, maybe? Yeah, let's, let's strap in. Um... <laughs> It's no so all three are good. I will say the Batman Zatanna one's kind of losing me a little bit, mm. but it does something fun, and I'll, and I'll get to it. The um, Ram V White Witch, I would say that should be required reading, just because it's Ram V and the artist from Blue and Green, and it does it. It did the impossible and made me appreciate Ghostmaker a little bit. So there's there's that. Uh, and then the the final story by uh, Carl Mostert on art in um, John and Blank, and I shouldn't because I like this guy a lot. Wonder Twins. Um, how many, uh, Mark Russell. There you uh, go. <laughs> yeah, is one of the best things I'm reading right now. So I'll start on the the Batman Zatanna if my book will load. It's the main problem now with the update, which I know we don't want to complain every week but like maybe it's my ipad but it's never been slower at pulling stuff <laughs> up um i do have an older ipad though too all right so the first story is the uh bound to our will batman zatanna it's vita ayala and nicola chamensha i don't know it looks like a very balkan name uh i'm just gonna let it go there but this is the uh batman zatanna they had the accident when they were younger trying to do a, a spell of some sort that now every year they have to get together and try to contain it. Um, and, and here we get a little bit of backstory of the kid that we saw at the very, very beginning that was running from, uh, I forget, I forget who exactly, but they were running, they get caught by who we're assuming is the main villain. Um, we get their backstory about their, you know, starting with, from the time they're uh, a year old, their mom's taking them to like underground gambling and, you know, to, to win some money. And she tells him his name's Jackie Day um, at age one. So like, let's not tell your dad about this. It gets to, you know, his dad um, when he's four, you know, hardworking in this restaurant. A lady comes and steals uh, stuff from out of the store says, you know, that's all right. She needed it more. So you're getting like this kid's moral compass is not off, but kind of all over the place. Um, when he's 14, his parents die. At 17, it shows like he's helping this um, older guy that seems like he has dementia, who he's lost. Uh, so he helps him get home. Um, at age 20, he's beating up a guy that looks like he was beating up on, a, on his girlfriend. You know, it's like, uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of person beats his boyfriend? Also, his boyfriend on boy. It's like, why don't you try, try picking on someone your own size? So it just shows that this guy, he, he's a good person at heart. And then it, it gets to when he was 28 and gets caught by this villain who performs this ritual on him, which releases, like, and this is where I get a little bit lost. Like, there are these magical beings that feed on emotions. And it makes it seem like Batman and Zatanna doing the ritual kind of reawoken these creatures. And it almost looks as if Vida Ayala has made the Jersey Devil and Mothman canonical DC creatures. So it, so it gets to, to Constantine explaining what he thinks is going on from his perspective to Batman and over this page um, as it's going, there's a bat and a Raven who which you assume represent uh, Bruce and Zatanna that they're swirling around this, this like whirlpool of energy and it brings to the attention Mothman and the Jersey devil who are two cryptids 
Um, I don't know if Pete knows who they are, but um, I know mm. Tim definitely would. Oh yeah, uh, Tim will know this sort of thing. Right? This is a mythological thing, or Tim will know. It. Yeah, so like it brings to the the attention of the what looks like the Jersey Devil and Mothman, who then feed off of Bruce and Zatanna. In that, you know, them having to go back every year to try to seal it just empowers these creatures more. To which it's it's inferred that Jackie Day is this reincarnation of one of them. And that over the course of time, they have kind of led humans. They've fed off of humans, off of these emotions. And that um, they were, like, responsible for... Um, cause just as Jackie's been gone for 300 years, but like they're responsible for teaching the Romans to, to play the fiddle while Rome burned in, um, just basically they're around when every bad thing happens. Cause that's what they feed off of. Um, and if you know your Mothman lore, that's what kind of seems like Mothman does. Like the Mothman shows up in these times of great peril. Um, and that, you know, that there these beings, um, that have powers like Batman or Zatanna, they're drawn more to them now because th- uh, their their powers prey on belief and that people believe in the superheroes. So these are like full on buffets for these two and that, you know, they're they're looking to um, Bruce and Zatanna to feed on. Um, so so Bruce and Constantine kind of have this back and forth and that Bruce like, I don't trust you, you're a trash human being, but you're kind of our only... You know, Zatanna trusts you. You're kind of our only chance at solving this. So they do some magic, and they're able to seal them off. Where they're in like this, uh, where are they? They're in like a church uh, building. Um, he's able to to seal them off, so these two beings can't find them. Um, and that um, that this that this them about going back and them sealing up every. You know, it isn't just like. Um, it isn't really a possession. It's not, it's kind of like magic trying to stabilize itself through Batman and Zatanna. Um, so Zatanna and Constantine have this moment, um, where, you know, he, you know, he's like, well, we'll get this figured out. Uh, they go to perform this ritual to try to purge them and the two energy beings come up and totally just take them all to task. Bruce tries to fight back. Zatanna is doing her reverse magic. Um, but it, it's a little bit too much. They overpower them, and it looks like they knock the soul out of Constantine, which then leads them to uh, look very, very sinister. Jackie Day and uh, the villain, you know, they're like, okay, now that he's taken care of, well, it's time to stop playing with our food. And it looks like they're going to go straight for Bruce and Zapana. Um, It's pretty, pretty, pretty good. It's a little bit... I. I get lost a little bit trying to figure out how, you know, Mothman and the powers of belief and the Jersey devil, why exactly they picked them to represent. Like we did, like, I understand Bruce as the bat and Zatanna as the Raven. Um, but why those, and then it's not touched on at all. And this is where I wish Connor was reading. Cause he's much more dialed in to this kind of stuff when it comes to magical and looking at things a certain way than, than I am. Um, but the art's pretty good. It has like, a good Rosmo kind of vibe to it. Like sometimes the proportions are a little off, but it's just cartoony enough to keep working. So it works really well with magic and like Bruce and, and Constantine's expressions towards each other are kind of over the top, but they work really well. Um, so I'll give this, this, this is part three out of six. It's about, I can't remember what I gave the other ones, um, but I'll, I'll give this a, a seven. Um, so that goes to the Ram V story, uh, stigma white, Witch with a non RK on the art. Uh, and this is just wrapping up where kind of, we know white witch from. So up to this point, she's been part of this group. She's having these memories of different missions where she's met with Bruce Wayne and whoever becomes ghost maker because they're in the same type of training. Uh, but the last memory she has before becoming the white witch is fighting back to back with ghost maker, um, and how during their training, they fell in love. And, um, this is the, you know, we didn't need words, but I promise I'd be at his side 
do all the blood and fire, certain deaths and close shaves. And I know he'd do the same for me, but then why'd it fall apart? So the and fire it, and the flames, we carry yeah, right? on. But that's, that's, right. all, that's all I heard there when you said that. <laughs> gotcha. But so they're trying to make their escape. They're trying to get back to the rendezvous. And a helicopter comes in. Um, and it's just too much. And she remembers Ghostmaker. Um, she remembers pulling Ghostmaker out of the way and sacrificing herself and just remembers his voice. And then she wakes up in the lab. And it does this really cool piece with, or the part with, or this page, right? I'll get there eventually. Of as she's having these memories from the stuff that we've seen in Catwoman, there's missing puzzle pieces in them. So, like, there's a small panel, but in that panel, there's puzzle pieces missing. And then as you go down the page, there's a hand holding the puzzle pieces, and it's intimated that this is Simon Saint's hands. And that she remembers she wakes, she breathes, she acquires her targets. This time it's Selena Kyle and Pamela Isley. More names, more masks to eliminate. And but then she starts remembering her past from before. And that's what leads to this this uh, awakening. Um, and it, it's kind of going, but it's when Ghostmaker showed up in Catwoman. And that's when everything starts to click. And he recognizes her and calls her Rhea. And she has a reaction like she's never had before and then takes out all of um saints guys um when she returns to the base she exacts her revenge the only way she knows how uh saint shows up and pulls out the gun and eliminates her uh but she promises she's like one day i'll i'll come back and it'll be the last thing you ever see and saint shoots her but instead of having this serene look on his face he looks worried and and that's the end uh it's really, really good. If this is ever collected, I would say give it a read because um, it does a, it's this really powerful piece on memory and the, you know, Adnan Arke's style has like this dreamlike quality to it because it's uh, like all the colors and everything kind of blend together at, at parts. And, and again, like that puzzle piece, really inventive layout to deal with the type of story. Um, and yeah, I hope we, I hope this isn't the last we see of White Witch with, with Ram V writing, because now this is a story that, you know, again, he made me invested in, in Ghostmaker for the first time ever, um, just because of the connection. And I don't know if it's an actual, like a romance love or like a, um, or like a, a friendship kind of love, but the fact that they had each other's back was enough to be her anchor. And that's what's going to pull her out from being this, you know, constantly revitalized assassin uh, that can face through stuff. So to just add depth to, to that character. Uh, I'm going to this one an 8.5. Okay. Uh, the final story is the Mark Russell, Carl Mostert, Ace the Bat Hound. And uh, as I get through this Kitty Turney story. Um, so it's got Batman fighting the Russian mob and the, you know, the, the lady that brought him comes to find out is the daughter of this Russian mobster who used to be in the Soviet military. And it, it starts on him in St. Petersburg in 78. And he's on this, uh, looks like a, well, they almost look like a boy scout, uh, thing that's called, uh, young pioneers. Um, but they go to this, this museum and he sees the Fabergé eggs and it's like the first time he's seen anything that extravagant, you know, growing up in Soviet Russia. And um, his dad had always told him he could always tell how how good of a uh, worker, like a carpenter, would be by the amount of tools that they have. Because the more tools they have, um, the less they know how to use of each one. And, you know, he Russell tells a story over as he's looking at the Fabergé eggs. With, you know, he says, being the son of a carpenter, seeing all those golden eggs lined up one after another, I asked myself, how different would it be to have such wealth and bring uh, such joy? So then it's these eggs and his upbringing to where, you know, live very sparsely. Well, that leads him to being this person that's looking at Batman chained up. Um, and we go back to the Gotham Pet Cemetery where all of the, uh, you know, uh, super pets, let's say, have escaped. Um, and the 
guy that's running is like, no, like, you don't understand. There's no pets buried here. That's what the incinerator's for. All the people buried in the pet cemetery are, are people the mob wanted disappeared. So, like, we got to find these pets because if they lead them back here, we're in trouble. Um, and the only pet that comes back is Lex Luthor, the dog that was trained that Lex couldn't handle, um, who, of course, you know, turns on the other pets. Um, and it, it shows all the pets going their separate ways. And it's got narration from the guy that runs it, you know, that these these animals are so broken. They they they're not going to know what to do that. They're, they'll just run anywhere. They'll run in circles because they're trying to they'll want to go back to their old life. But there's no life to go back to. So the the chicken that's in the wheelchair goes up to Ace and all the other animals start following Ace and they basically become a team and they're going to go find Batman. And they're going to fix all of these. Ace leads them into Gotham, leads them to the, the club that um, Bruce was at. And, you know, of course, there's no one there. But someone left a note that smells like Batman. And so uh, Ace starts following uh, that uh, scent to where Batman is. Uh, this other, the, the mob boss that's talking to him, he's wearing like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen Boardwalk Empire, but the pieces I've seen, one of the characters has like a half face mask that's kind of like a Phantom of the Opera, but it's also like an actual face. Like it's not just the white, but he's wearing one of, he's wearing one of those. Um, and, uh, he's going to look at, at Brute or look at Batman and his daughter reminds him that, you know, no, he's worth more to whoever we sell him to, to unmask him. Uh, and uh, all Bruce is concerned about is where's Ace. And, um, you know, Batman brings up that this guy has a mask, too, that they're kind of the same. And he goes, yeah, well, let's see what's behind yours. So he decides, like, he's just going to throw out. He doesn't care. He wants to know who Batman is for all this disrespect. And, and as uh, they try to take the mask off, Batman's mask defenses come into play. And the first guy gets electrocuted. And then and sometimes this might be too far, but I'm going to give Russell the benefit of the doubt the, because of his style. Um, the next guy that tries to take it off ends up getting hit with a flamethrower that's coming out of the cowl. It's like Bruce has somehow built a flamethrower into his eyebrow region of his of it. Uh, so they can't take off the the mask. Um, so, you know, they're getting ready to to send him off now because he's like, oh, I'm not going to see his face. Let's just sell Batman. And um, the the daughter puts a gas mask on and, you know, um, knocks Batman out with a gas. So then um, as they're transporting Batman, uh, the Soviet... The uh, general guy starts telling a story about this lion in a zoo, and and uh, he once read a story about that, you know, to save money they would feed the the lion dogs and cats from the local area, but one day this this puppy that they tried to feed it to thought it was a game and awakened something in this lion and they became best friends, um, and up until the day that the the puppy died, you know, um. That they thought like, oh, now well, the lion can be a lion again, but it wasn't that the lion ended up dying of sadness. And as as he's telling the story, we're seeing Ace and all of these these super pets go through this this place that Batman was being held and just taking out the bad guys. You have the the bear, you know, making guards open doors and um, them looking for for him, uh, looking for Bruce and the. The daughter's like, oh, okay, so what was the point of that story? And he goes, oh, eh, it's just a story. Sometimes stories don't have meanings. Which made me think of the story that Tom King had told that was also a Russian like folk story that apparently Bruce liked to to hear when he was a kid, which I wonder if this is uh, Russell's kind of take on, on that. It's just a little bit more explicit in the, oh, there's kind of no point to it. Um, but... Uh, Ace goes into the room where Bruce was being held and he sees like a like a, an impression of a bat symbol. So I don't know if this is just him seeing like this is where Batman was. 
Um, but they're as they're the other pets are are waiting for him to come back out. Lex or Lix Luther has led a team of snipers up on the roof to where I don't know to where the animals are, and they're waiting for him. And that's where the story ends. Um, I hope this doesn't go too tragic. There's still three issues left, but I'm already getting uh, uh, Pride of Baghdad vibes, where Russell has really made me care about these animals that are you know broken and they seem like they don't have any worth. Um, yet Ace is teaching them because Bruce taught him his worth um, and that they're finding worth by working together. Um, and I just don't want anything bad to happen to him. Um, but I'm super invested into this story. That's why I picked up this. As, as good as Ram V1 was, this is really why I picked this book up. Um, but yeah, so I'll give this one an eight. All right. So what's your overall written then? If you're out um, I'll, I'll give the over, I guess I gave what, what, what did I give the Ram V1? Since you, you wrote it down. I didn't. You, oh, I thought you wrote it down. I'll write your overall down for this. I don't write oh, the individual shoot. ones. shoot. <laughs> I'll give the overall one. I'll give it an overall an eight then. Yeah, just, just, uh, just, just pick a number. Yeah. There you go. Okay, cool. All right. Um, Naomi, season two, issue one. Brian Michael Bendis writing and David F. Walker as well writing with Jamal Campbell on the art. So... We've been quite down on Bender's stuff recently and dropped most of what he's done, but we did like Naomi season one, so there was some optimism coming mm -hmm. in that this would be a return to form. And maybe the fact that he's got a co writer is something to latch on to, to look forward to. Uh, and obviously, it does take place after the events that have kind of happened with her in other books. I felt like I didn't, I wasn't missing anything though. I feel like the way it starts off is like, oh, she's <laughs> been off an adventure, she's fought Black Adam, whatever. That's fine. She summed up everything in uh, in uh, therapy, and and I feel like that was therapy for me. Um, <laughs> because had Bendis just not, if he wasn't writing Justice League, and this was just season two, yeah. and he was intimating things that had happened, I think I would enjoy this a lot more. Because it is, it's coming off as a kid that has no one else to tell this to but their therapist, and the therapist isn't judging. So, of course, they're not going to be like, oh, no, you didn't go with Black Adam. They're like, okay, so tell me how that made you feel, you know, fighting Black Adam. Um, and I guess this is the Bendis that I, I like. Yeah, and it, it does start off as well as all the different teenagers, like, mm -hmm. giving their opinion on what's going on with Naomi. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it feels very linked to how the first season started, and mm -hmm. the art's very good by, by Campbell. Uh, yep. It is beautiful throughout. And it sets up that she's having a bit of a rough time with her parents. Like, they're having really awkward times at home. Her father, in particular, has a really awkward relationship with her right now. He's been hypercritical, hyper uh, worried about everything she's doing, about how she's going to use her powers, the idea that she might hurt someone with her powers, so she has to train better. And she's agreeing as much as she can, but no matter mm -hmm. what she says, it's not the right thing. He's still finding a way to sort of snipe back and say, Oh, this isn't right though. Then this is no. You need to be careful with this, and so on and so on. Um. So that's the big thing that it kind of sets up. Of course, is that conflict. Uh, she's got this friendship going with D, the mechanic, who's the Thanagarian. Mm -hmm. Yep. And she's going to him to confide in as well. Uh, he's like, yeah, we'll train, we'll do stuff. Uh, and he's may come over and hang out with her and her parents for dinner that night, and he doesn't show up. Uh, so Naomi, towards the end of the issue, decides to go off and check what's going on, and she checks out his his uh this mechanics shop and goes in, finds evidence of a struggle. There's a hole in the the ground, uh, mm -hmm. in the sort of basement area, and then her dad shows up wearing like sunglasses and a balaclava, <laughs> and is like, "What are you doing here, young lady? You're breaking your entering now," which is exactly what he's doing. Right. <laughs> uh, so the issue ends with her saying, what, what did you do? Is as, as if she's assuming that he's behind whatever's happened to Dee. In reality, I feel like he was just also doing what she was, which is checking right. out Check. and figuring out why he didn't show up. See where he went. Yeah, because don't forget, he's Rainian. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, they, you know, they go back to their antenna going work. There's issues going on between him and mom because they are not talking. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering what's going on there. Um, this this first issue of season two it, it didn't have that same feeling as season one, to where I was instantly satisfied with with certain things, 
it's still very good though right like the voices of each of the characters are spot on like her friend being like oh no man i wish wish my parents didn't talk they're way too lovey-dovey you know you know what it's like having to watch your parents make out you know <laughs> like i i liked all of that that again that was a kind of bendis banter that i feel has been missing from the bendis books that i had been reading um, yeah, it's not that inter- true. It's that interpersonal stuff. It's like her mm-hmm. talking to her friends and just dealing with the fact that everyone knows she's this like superhero with eight, like mm-hmm. powers now, and yeah. how people are treating her differently. And you know, a lot of it's through the perspective of this this therapy session, and then her with her friend who's sort of like there to witness the the awkward family dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a solid start. Uh. I like that the stakes feel relatively small. You know, it's like one person's went missing. Why is he went missing? And there's conflict with her parents. I like that it feels quite pared down because sh- even though she has these big powers and she yep. has a super villain who's from another dimension because that's where she comes from and she says she wants to go and fight him. I like season one because even though the backstory feels really big, I like how small in scope the story actually is in present yep. day. And I hope season two kind of sticks to that. I think it's to its benefit. That said, though, there is that moment where she's imagining being in the other dimension, you know, when her friend's, like, talking to her and she has to snap out of it. There's that gorgeous mm-hmm. two-page spread of, yeah. like, the big skull off in the distance with the fire coming out of its eyes and the, you know, she's just falling through the sky kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really pretty, really nice. Um, I could certainly do with more Jamal Campbell art in my life. Yep. Uh, so. and, and it reminded me too, I need to go back. I need to track down those issues of Lost Sector, right? Yeah. Far no. Sector. Far Sector. Uh, far Sector and finish that because I was enjoying that. It was just a lot to be taking in with all the delays. Yeah, the delays just kill. Yeah, we're killing it for me. Yeah. But it, it did remind me. I was like, oh yeah, man, the, the Campbell art in that was so good. I, I owe it to go back and finish it at some point. Uh, yeah. maybe, I'll, maybe next time I'm at the shop, I'll look for the... Uh, obviously a lot of it's the fashion. expressions and the shading and the art and the you know the actual mm-hmm. like physical art but i want to point out the coloring as well it's like towards the end when naomi goes to check out the mechanic shop mm-hmm. uh like everything's this you know cold blues of nighttime but she's this bright yellow and the glow of her, her light is like hitting the, the world around her it just looks mm-hmm. really good like it just you, you feel the impact of her presence uh at all times so no nah, it's really good so yeah yeah, very expressive. I, you know, I, I think this is a solid first issue. I, I was kind of worried before I started this that I was going to read this and go, oh, no, I'm, I'm just off Bendis now. Like, I'm just, like, he's not writing anything good. I did, I, I did too. I saved this for last uh, just because I was like, I kept putting it off. And I picked it up physically. So I was like, I'm, I don't don't waste your money here. It's, it's taking up space. And mm-hmm. when it was good, I was relieved. Like, uh, it was a nice, solid little read. Uh, I want to know what's going on with D. Um, and I'm glad that Naomi actually gets to be the focus of her own book instead of, you know, every other book that Bendis is writing. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's because right away you have this this page with all these panels of all the different teenagers talking about her, and they've all got mm-hmm. wild stories, like, you know, saying different things about her. And all right away, it's like, no, this is this is a tone that I associate with Naomi. And I feel that we're returning home mm-hmm. to a character to sort of catch up and what what she's going through, um, and the the, uh, the the sense of humor that comes from this type of introduction with all these characters, uh, it's personality. There's there's a lot of personality in this mm-hmm. book, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why it kind of clashed when it felt like Justice League was focusing yeah. more on Naomi than anything else. Is it? It's like when you just throw in the Justice League, she doesn't feel that special because it's, it's right. she's just another super powered person. Here, though, having all these, like, townsfolk react to the fact that one of their locals has superpowers now, she feels like a big deal. She feels special. Mm-hmm. She, it feels like we're really playing to the strengths of what season one did. And, I, you know, so I'm feeling optimistic about this right now. Yeah. So Yeah. Also, I wonder how much of that is David F. Walker. Uh, that's true. We, can, we can't discount the fact that there's a co-writer on this. There's a co-writer. And, and maybe Bendis is at this, just this point in his career that he has so many ideas going on that he maybe needs a co-writer to help, you know organize them because you know we still know like bendis can still write snappy you know exchanges and whatnot um it's just kind of these bigger ideas needing to be smoothed out or toned down uh so yeah maybe maybe walker has some some influence and uh, you know a lot of this is very ultimate spider-man which is one of the best things that bendis has ever done right you know it's just the character getting powers and learning who they are and discovering Mm -hmm. themselves 
like at least in the early Ultimate Spider-Man, obviously it went on a long time, so it wasn't always that, but no, that, that was very much they, what it was at the start. He also did that with, with Miles too, right? Like, yeah, not Miles too. Like, you know, that seems to be his, his, you know, that's his niche, right? Like, like John's kind of plays with continuity. I feel like uh, Bendis does this really good job of young heroes coming into their own. Like, he's that coming of age superhero guy. I think a notable exception to that uh, is his Daredevil run, which is fantastic yeah. and is... Uh, very much the opposite. It's very different, that. yeah, it's not that. Yeah, it's... Yeah. It's a fall from grace story instead of a go. It was go gritty, it's dark, it's a crime yeah. thing, you know. It's just very mind different. you, mind you. I'm halfway through the second trade of Zdarsky's, mm. and oh my god, this is the most I've been into Daredevil since. Oh, it's good. Yeah. The Brubaker, uh, right after Bendis. I've read the so, first three trades of that. I think now. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 real good. Not not to take away from any of that stuff, but it, you just reminded me. So yeah. Uh, all right, what are you giving Naomi? I'm going to give Naomi uh, an 8. Okay. Uh, I'm going to agree with the 8. Uh, it was a solid start to Season 2. So, And I'm happy to say that because I was a little bit worried before I started yeah. it. So, that's cool stuff. Um, Alright. So, everybody to patreon.com slash TV. You can make myself a corner read a book at one of the higher tiers. Uh, so, I'm going to get one out of the way right now. Whilst it's a quiet week, I'm going to talk about American Vampire Issue 24. Uh, this is a very fast moving arc, so it's kind of cool that I'm getting to this just a week after doing the last issue. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like all this is taking place during a car chase, and there's like flashbacks setting up the character of Travis, but also like how this encounter with Skinner Sweet came about. And again, there's a little bit more of that. This issue with more. The, the last issue ended with Skinner's car on fire and Skinner jumping to the hood of Travis's car, and keep in mind the girls and the, the, the passenger seat as well. And Travis gets up with his knife and goes to jump in Skinner. And he admits in his narration that he's attacking Skinner. He's, you know, he's tracked him down just now because he's at his weakest when they're at, like, the the opposite of a full moon. Like, when there's no moon. Right. A new moon. <laughs> a new moon. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's what you call it. Uh, so... I almost said total eclipse. It's not an eclipse, but the reason no. why... I, the reason why I thought of that, though, is because there used to be a Jaffa Cake advert in the UK where uh, it was like a teacher talking to like sort of uh, kindergarten kind of age kids and basically saying, oh, this is how the moon works. And she pulls out a Jaffa cake, which is a sort of cookie-sized, mm-hmm. soft treat that's got like an orange flavor inside it. It's like sponge and it's got chocolate at the top. Anyway, the joke of the advert is, is that she'd say, this is a full moon. And then she'd bite it and go, this is a half moon. Well, I'm out to still full. And then she'd shove the rest of it and go, probably eclipse, whilst her mouth was full. And the joke was is she was just using her lesson to have an excuse to eat a bunch of Jaffa cakes in front of the kids right. and not giving the kids any. That popped out of my head, which is why I said Total Eclipse. Anyway. Gotcha. <laughs> so yes, uh, Skinner and, and Travis are fighting. Uh, the girl's trying to take control of the car, but you know, it's just all chaos. Skinner's car is still in front of them on fire and Travis like lands on top of it when Skinner hits him and Skinner actually jumps into the like Travis's car, holds the girl back and says, yeah, we're going to, uh, you know, drive this some bitch off a cliff. Uh, we cut back to the sanitarium where Travis was being, like, given shock treatment and stuff as a kid and told that he was living in a fantasy. Uh, but he gets delivered a note with a key uh, saying, in defense of fa- fantasies, and it's basically Hobbs is, like, breaking him out. Hobbs is giving him a key to, to get out. Uh, but Travis, on his way out, decides to go in and, I don't know if he kills the doctor who was torturing him, but he, at the very least, like, roughs him up because he comes in because they were because one of the things that he's talking about when he's torturing them earlier on the issue is he says that uh oh you're into all this race car music i like this type of music so when travis goes in you don't see it you do this a really inventive couple of panels because you just stay out in the hallway but you see the speech bubbles coming out the door says this is for your taste of music and then you just hear the doctor screaming so it's like a really uh kind of dark but like kind of cathartic kind of demise of the, the the evil doctor but all this is going on as we see Travis climbing up Skinner's car while it's on fire, and then he's driving Skinner's car, and we cut back again to like just before this all started, where he's tracked down Skinner to this place, this house, and he's searching the house. There's an old movie poster which harkens back to the first arcs of the book, and then he hears Skinner speed off in the car, so then he has to run out and start driving after him. So we're, we're kind of like almost caught up in terms of flashbacks, 
Uh, there is one part of this story left, but I feel like we've got most of them out of the way now. Uh, but now he's in Skinner's car, which is on fire, and he skids round, and they're racing towards what looks like a cliff. It's not a big cliff, as we see when they actually go off the edge of it, but there's so much action in this. So much of this is like, it's a very quick read. This entire arc's been a very quick read. And it's been all speed lines, there's been a lot of like, uh, just really atmospheric stuff where it, it feels cool, it feels like there's fire, it feels like there's energy. Uh, this issue steam as consequences. Travis has been talking about uh, this interview he heard on TV about the teenage brain. And it, in this issue, he talks about specifically how the guy on TV said that youths don't understand consequences. And he says, I looked up consequences in the Scrabble dictionary in the sanitarium. <laughs> and it basically said, you know, there's cause and effect, and the effect is the consequence. And he's like, well, the consequence for Skinner murdering my family is that I'm going to kill that son of a bitch. <laughs> like, that's, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's the, the gist of what he says. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of atmosphere, even when Hobbs like, tries to pick up young Travis in the rain. And it's like his hair's like soaking wet from the rain, and Hobbs is like, "Come in, kid. I'll help you kill the vampires." And then Hobbs gets kicked out of the car, and he steals Hobbs's car, which is just kind of funny. Um, but yeah, so there's this great two-page spread actually towards the end, this layout where the cars are going off the cliff, and as it goes off the cliff, you have the panels kind of split up. It almost as if it's like rays of sunshine, as if the the cars coming off for the, the the circle of the sun, and you've got all these lines going up, separating all these panels like sun rays. And it's basically just parts of, like, Travis's past and uh, and Skinner's past. And, like, Travis listening to music, them both been behind the wheel. Um, Travis hunting down vampires and just all these things that kind of... So it's all the story, like, so far. And then there's a full-page spread of the cars flying through the air before they land. The art is phenomenal. The, the art is really the 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 showpiece of this arc because it is so dependent on art and the, the action that's happening uh which is not a complaint because it's very thrilling it works really well uh skinner's car flips and it's travis is in that car so he kind of crawls out and he's, he's he's got like a broken arm by the looks of it he's trailing blood sunrise is happening he yells out skinner it's all very dramatic and action movie-esque and then the final page is Skinner behind him. Full page spread saying morning sunshine uh, with his teeth out. Uh, I, I guess if, if I have a critique of this issue or this arc, is that this cliffhanger and the last cliffhanger are basically the same thing, which is a full page spread of, of Skinner being threatening and like, okay, now he has to deal with Skinner. Uh, it's a minor nitpick, but it's just really kind of the case of you're having it all be one big chase. So ultimately there's only so many things you could do as cliffhangers beyond just oh, Skinner's got him down and out, or Skinner's, like, been threatening again. This one has more impact than the last one because it really sets the idea up that once Sun rises, like, he's more powerful, and Travis admits that when he's at his most powerful, he can't take him. So, it's an effect of Cliffhanger, but it is very similar to the last Cliffhanger, so I think that's worth just kind of maybe docking a little point or two for. But, uh, I can't deny it's thrilling, though. Like, it's still, mm -hmm. it feels kind of cool, which is kind of the point. Like, you know, this character's supposed to be this cool 50s greaser. That's kind of the vibe that it's going for. So, I think Snyder here does a really good job. I mean, I mean, I know Snyder's a big Elvis fan, so he's really a fan mm -hmm. of this era and this kind of vibe. And I think it is oozing constantly throughout the whole issue and the whole arc. So, so cool. Uh, I'll probably give it a solid... Um, I'll go 8.5. I probably would have given it in the 9. But given the cliffhanger is so similar to the last cliffhanger, I'll dock at the half point and say 8.5. So that is the score. And that will take us out of the part of the show where we pick our favorite stuff of the week. Favorite panel slash more, favorite cover, favorite art, and top five books. And I only read four, so in this case it'll only be top four books. But, yeah, you know, same difference. Uh, so we'll start off with panel slash moment. Matt, what you got? Uh, it's going to be from Superman, Son of Kal-El. And... It's uh, I'm just gonna go for the hug. That sure. Yeah, that yeah. Dick gives gives John that whole, that whole lead up. But this this issue was just full of a bunch of different ones. Um. Oh yeah, like I mean, I'll just jump in main because main yeah. is uh, Nightwing falling off the building, but looking really casual as he does it. Mm -hmm. That 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 was my as as yeah. John is revealed to be flying there's, up. There's that uh, when when the dude from the rising headbutts, uh, John. And then it, oh, the yeah. panel in the corner, just the expression that Dick has, the, ah, uh, who's stupid enough to head up Superman? Just, like, it's paced so and, well. And he brings it up again, like, the next page, mm -hmm. where he's, like, 
Right, well, we could ask this guy, but he's, you know, he headbutted Superman, so he's clearly not that bright. <laughs> he's not the cleverest, yeah. 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 So. No, it's good stuff. I think what, part of what I like about that panelist of Dick looking so casual as he's mm-hmm. falling, as John's flying up, like, alongside him, yeah. is that I think you expect when you turn that page that, oh, John's going to catch him. He's got him. Yeah. yeah. So the fact that it kind of subverts that a little bit to, like, he doesn't need saving, he's just falling in style, <laughs> you know? Exactly. To quote Buzz, to quote Buzz Lightyear, he's falling in style. Oh as uh john flies up i think it's a nice little swerve but it just feels super cool so Mm -hmm. that's my pick uh cover of the week do you have a a choice yeah so i'm gonna go from uh the uh, batman urban legends there is a variant that's done by marquez that has nothing to do with anything in the books it just looks really nice um it's got i'm trying to pull it up here um no, no, yeah. It's got uh Azrael, uh it looks so it looks like it's a, a part of a larger piece, but it's got uh Tim and Steph, it looks like the outsiders, um Cass is there. I just it looks really cool. So I, I like it a whole lot. That's cool. Um yeah, there's a few good choice. I mean, I think the main detective cover is pretty solid, mm-hmm. uh, as are some of the variants for that. Uh, I think the Travis Moore Superman cover is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to the variant for Naomi as well, uh, which mm-hmm. is the Carla Cohen variant. Uh, it's just it's one of those super lifelike kind of yeah. digital paintings that just looks really good. Um, but my pick is going to be from Batgirls, actually. It's going to be the Michael Cho variant. It's just it's a little bit pulpy. It's got this you know pink and yellow background, just flat colors, and it's just like, you know, cast like, got the cape mm-hmm. across her and i don't know it's just this it's, it's uh, there's a pulpiness that's appealing to me in that uh versus the other super realistic stuff that's on some of the other yeah. covers so uh just what i'm in the mood for this week i guess but uh that's my pick so uh all right top part of the week matt uh redondo yep yeah i'll just make it quick it's redondo for me as well uh, um, I mean, Kamal, Sha- Campbell's close. Don't get yep. me wrong. Campbell's very Chelsea good. Campbell and, of course, Fornes, but, you know, that's not a full issue. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. So, I think you made the mistake I did earlier and called him Frankie Villa when you were talking about it. Now I'm thinking about it. I feel like you said Frankie Villa. Did I? Time. I think so. And I did that last time, which is well, why. And I just said Fornes and it's Blanco. Yeah. Lord. We're terrible. <laughs> Spanish names. I mean, we're yeah, it's not for yeah, that's a good point. It's not for us. Blanco. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Fernando Blanco, George Fornes, Francisco Franco Villa, Uwe. Yes. So I looked silly last week. You look twice as silly that, this week. I'm okay with that's that. That's okay. Hey, those are all three artists I really enjoy though too. Oh yeah, so, they're like, all good artists. So, like, yeah, there's no complaints. Yeah. No, no ill will there. Yeah. Uh yeah, uh yeah, redondo, yeah. All right, there you go. Top five of the week. Uh, number one is Superman, son of Kal-El. Number two is uh, Naomi. Number three is Urban Legends. Four is Tech. And five, yeah, Amazons. It's only because, uh, you know, I yeah, have to have it there. It was left. Yeah, it was the last one. Yeah, uh, yeah my number one is Superman, son of Kal-El. Number two is Detective Comics. Number three is Naomi. And then number four is Batgirls. So... Probably not a shocking list, but mm-hmm. that's what it is. I will tell you what is coming next week from DC Comics, and we will have Detective Comics 1057. We have Nightwing issue 90. We got The Flash 780. We got Wonder Woman 785, which, while we are reading that book, we'll probably be skipping that issue because it's part of the Trial of the Amazons. Mm-hmm. We have Justice League 74, Catwoman 41, Batman the Night issue 3, Batman Superman World's Finest issue one, so that's the start of the Mark Wade book, so pretty pumped about that. Uh, mm-hmm. Robins issue five, Green Lantern issue 12, Titans United issue seven, Blue and Gold issue seven, Refrigerator Full of Heads issue five, DC Horror Presents Soul Plumber issue six, Wonder Woman Evolution issue five, and Looney Tunes issue 265. So so, th- so that flash, are you checking that one out? Because it is a tie-in to this Earth 3 BS that is a good question, actually, yeah. I was going to say, well, why wouldn't that be? Because I'm yeah. in Flash, but you're right, it's part of a, a crossover yeah. thing. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I guess okay. I'll, I'll have a look at the preview, if I can see okay. it. Do they even have previews anymore since they put it to I don't know. I, if they do. I don't think so. I haven't checked. But, uh, um, but I mean, there's usually... It seems pre- like there's usually he's pre- going to 
There's usually previews on a website somewhere. I'll I'll look for a preview and see what it actually is. So it seems like he's going off the the um Celeste it is even the fastest man alive can outrun all the danger of the water earth three enlisted by his former teammates on the titans wally west helped bring the titans to earth three but will any of them make it home chased by earth three johnny quick the scarlet speedster quickly finds himself running out of options uh warfare three tie-in and it's dennis hopeless writing so uh bobby thompson so it's probably it's probably a skip it's probably yep. a skip fernando pasarin on art which i don't mind pasarin so yeah. it's part of a crossover yeah, where i'm not reading probably... the rest of the things so it's probably a skip Should, are they gonna make me read wonder woman why because i feel no i have enough books attack nightwing finest the night uh why, why? Heads, i have five that's enough well why do you feel they might make you read wonder woman well because maybe i don't have enough books but five all oh, right enough. okay i see yeah five five's enough sure yeah um all right, well, there you go. Uh, plus, yeah. there's a good chance we'll be solicits next week, so yeah, probably. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, but there you go. Uh, of course, I will take this time to thank our Patreon producers for the month. So thank you very much to Tyler Hess, Cindy Palacios, David Sharp, Bordenow, Christopher Moy, David Brown, Al Treisman, and Alison M. Fordyce. They are Patreon producers for the month of March. Of course, you can support us at patreon.com slash TV for as little as a dollar per month to help keep the show coming and all the other content we produce. And of course, at the $5 tier, you get early access to the show uh, sometime late in the Saturday when it's fresh out of the oven. You don't have to wait until the Sunday release time. So go and have a look and see if you're interested in helping support the content. Uh, of course, you can support us always, though, by liking, subscribing, dinging the bell for notifications on YouTube, rating the podcast five stars, and giving us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, share us about on Twitter, at DC Comics Podcast. You can find us on there. Uh and by all means, keep suggesting things for uh, episode 300, should you wish. Because <laughs> um, I'm out of ideas, I'm not going to lie. I, I haven't thought yeah. of it yet. But maybe something I'll, 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 something wacky will come to mind. But uh, yeah, so go, go, uh, go have a look. See. And uh, see if you're interested in all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, otherwise, though, that is pretty much us. Um, this has been episode 296 of Comments in the Multiverse. So we'll be back next week. Uh, most likely with Connor, and we'll be talking about uh, the penultimate part of the tower and Detective Comics Mm -hmm. and all these other things that are going on. So, uh, yes, we'll see you next time. Keep reading DC Comics, and remember to never get lost in the Speed Force.